no introduction but uh my guest here does steve christie why don't you uh, introduce yourself a little bit to everybody all right well first vincent i want to say thank you for having me on and interviewing me the the pleasure is all mine um i was raised a very devout catholic brought up in a very loving catholic home i was actually elected treasurer of the knights of the altar of my parish which put me fourth in rank of all the altar boys in my parish so it was extreme privilege and you know for a 13 year old and I went on to graduate from a Catholic grade school, high school, and college um, Catholic schools. And it was at the towards the end of my Catholic college education that I converted to Protestantism. I heard the gospel for the first time straight out of the Bible, the concept of being saved by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone, and that his atonement on the cross was sufficient. And that um, justification co- comes not by grace being infused through the sacraments, but rather God's um, grace being imputed to us, which you find in passages like um, Romans chapter 4, uh, chapter 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. But getting back to the topic, when I was, you know, of the treasurer of the Knights of the Altar, I noticed we had two books that, or two Bibles that were in our home. And one was the New Catholic version of the Bible, and the other one was a Gideon Bible, which we know is a, Protestant Bible that you find in hotel rooms. And I just happened to be going through like the table of contents and I noticed that the the Protestant Bible was smaller than the Catholic Bible in terms of the number of books that were in them. There were some books that were in the Catholic Bible that weren't in the Protestant Bible. And I just found that, you know, interesting. I didn't know why. I didn't know if one was like an abridged version or something. I, and I never really got a good answer from it from the people I talked with. And I kind of forgot about it. And then after I Um, converted to um, Protestantism, I got interested in in the subject again, and and, um, I started researching a little bit. I started going on um, Catholic websites and and videos like Catholic Answers, and lo and behold, I came across Jimmy Aiken, who's the senior apologist for Catholic Answers, and he stated that the Pharisees had a bigger... um, canon that the Sadducees supposedly and they had the same books that were in Protestant Old Testaments today and I had been reading the Bible for a while and I'm like wait a minute the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee so does that mean his canon was the same that was that was as Protestant Old Testaments as well because if that's the case the um, the Christian canon in the first century was identical to the Protestant canon not the Catholic canon and then the rest of they say is history and a few years later, I wrote my book, and here we are today. From my understanding, you wrote another book. Yeah, yeah, and that's why I say kind of the one grew out of the other, because I gave kind of a top ten reason why a kids grow up Christian, why they walk away from the church. And, and one of those reasons is that they, they, they grew up realizing that not all groups under Christendom all agree on the same things. I mean, for instance, Catholics will believe one thing, Protestants will believe something else, and, you know, and even though Jehovah's Witness isn't really considered Christian, if you take a look, um, as far as the umbrella term, they'll, they'll, they'll put them under, under the label, even though they're not actually Christians. Um, and one of those differences is the canon, you know, and I realized real early on that was important because if all scripture is inspired or God breathed, then there's only two different types of books, books that come from God and books that are written by men. And one of the reasons a lot of times they'll walk away from Christianity altogether is because they're like, shouldn't all Christians basically believe the same thing, but they don't even believe in their own, um, you know, their own Bibles and you know, what, what books belong into that. So that's why I said the second book kind of grew out of the first one. Right, that makes complete sense. They're in paperback too, right? You can get them paperback. Yeah, both of them are paperback. Now I don't have an author's page, so you have to kind of look for them. But if you type in "why Protestant Bibles are smaller," that should pop up. But the other one is 
Um, not really of us. Why do children of Christian parents abandon the faith? You might have to type the thing out um, because of the lack of the author you know, page. But, you know, they both are on there. They're both on paperback. And I believe they're both in um, ebook format as well. Yeah, I bought my uh, one on the Canon on Kindle. Yeah. So, you, interestingly enough, I, I kind of want to ask you, because I think there's a little bit of confusion and there's a difference given on the audience or uh, the the Catholic or Orthodox apologist presenting this argument. What What is the canon argument? Well, the canon argument is basically what canon that Jesus and the apostles embraced, and at the same time, was there a set canon of the Jews during this period of time? And this is where the Catholic argument is a bit inconsistent, because they will agree with the Council of Trent and the Catechism of the Catholic Church that Jesus and the apostles handed down what the canon was hand to hand all the way down to the Council of Trent but in the same breath they'll say well the Old Testament canon developed over time like just like the New Testament canon developed over time and that there are different canons in the first century and in my book I respond to Jimmy Aiken's claim that the Sadducees only embraced the five books of Moses while the Pharisees embraced the identical canon that that uh, Protestants do. And and I, I frame my book to respond specifically to Jimmy Aiken's claim that even if that was true, the Sadducees only embraced the Torah. Well, if you le- read the New Testament, Jesus didn't embrace strictly the Torah, even when he was talking with the Pharisees. I mean, like, when the Pharisees and Sadducees are t- together and they ask for a sign, he says, um, look to the sign of Jonah, and he quotes Jonah one seventeen. Well, if the... Sadducees only embraced the five books of Moses, then that wouldn't have meant anything to him. You know, or when he's standing before the Sanhedrin and, and he ends up quoting the Psalms, and I think, I think it's Zechariah, um, the Sanhedrin wasn't just made up of Pharisees, but Sadducees too, so that wouldn't have meant anything to them. Or when the Apostle Paul um, tells calls a high priest a whitewashed tomb, that comes from Ezekiel, that insult wouldn't have meant anything to the high priest who would have been a Sadducee. You know, and then there's other you know books that the Sadducees embrace, which we can find out in, from Jewish literature, such as Josephus, and and this is something I brought up in my debate against Trent Horn, and when I brought up Job, and he's like, well, well, Job was uh, believed to be attached or part or something of the five books of Moses, but it's like it wasn't part of the five books of Moses, and what do you do with all these other books as well? And the belief that the Sadducees only um, embrace the five books comes from Origen in the early third century because he had read literature in the second century which conflated the Sadducees with the Samaritans. And as we know, the Samaritans only believed in the, the Pentateuch, you know, the Greek um, five books of Moses. Um, so he just assumed that they only embraced, you know, that the Sadducees only embraced the five books of Moses too. And that false assumption based on that conflation got passed down to the Catholic Church. And this is this is why they believe they only believe in the five books when in reality they most likely believed in the same books that the pharisees did yeah i think when you challenge trent horn on the very topic he i, I hate to say or or one of the the popular catholic apologists they only appeal to like a, it as a scholarly kind of tradition mm-hmm. and i don't yeah i don't think uh the the intuitions of scholars are the best thing to base our faith on no because scholars disagree with each other and that's a point that i even make in my book because some people will say well Protestants are only picking and choosing which early church fathers to draw from and which ones they don't. And that's not the reason why we draw from them. The reason we draw from them is because they don't all agree. Now, the closer you get to the time of Christ, and again, the the early church fathers who knew it was in the Hebrew Bible, you find that the books that they specifically call the canonical Old Testament are either identical or nearly identical to to Protestant Old Testament today, the only one that's usually omitted occasionally is Esther. And there's reasons, you know, why Esther might not have been included, which I talked about in the debate as well as in the book. Right. This also is, this is still why my first question still confuses me, because it seems like Catholics want to argue something that's sort of, that the church is necessary in order to know the canon. But mm-hmm. they back away from that claim when, when we start discussing sort of these historical matters and, oh, well, you know, if it was handed down in the first century, then it seems like, contra the Catholic, seems like the Protestants on the better footing 
because if these, like you said, if, if the, the claims of Trent was correct, that this has always been the faith, it seems unlikely, well, you know, the canon would just become so jaded. Yeah, and the thing is, too, is it, it opens up, there, there's an elephant that's in the room, because if you ask it, uh, Catholic, do you believe Jesus knew what the boundaries of the Old Testament was? And was like, well, yeah, he's God. Of course he did. Do you think that, that the apostles knew? Well, yeah, they walked with him for three years, and, and that's something that Jesus would not have um, hid from them. And when you read the apostles in the New Testament, when they talk about the Old Testament, it's really clear that they knew what the Old Testament was. So if the canon developed over time, the only way that would happen is if Jesus and the apostles purposely or inadvertently didn't tell them what the Old Testament canon was. And if they didn't, then there's no way that the Catholic Church could know what the boundaries were. And that's that's a problem. Plus, it contradicts what they believe about Trent and the Catechism, because it actually says that they did pass that canon down. So it's kind of um, doublespeak with them. They kind of can contradict each other. Right. I, I, that's why it seems like the more, I don't want to say, well, I guess I can say this, scholarly Catholic apologists will try to, like Michael Lofton, your discussion with him, he backed kind of away from that position, even though 90% of like Catholics that are on the internet will hold to the stronger position. He, right, yeah, and yeah, go ahead. Uh, he'll hold to something like, uh, no, you can still know the canon apart from the church, given historical evidences, but it seems like all the evidence is sufficient to establish the Catholic position. That's what I think his position is, you can correct me if I'm wrong. No, I think you got that you know, right. And the other thing too is that why would we, if we're if we haven't established what the canon actually is, what's God breathed and what isn't, why should we even trust the church to begin with? Because the argument is, well, the church is the um, the pillar and shield of the truth. But if you actually look really closely at it, it doesn't say that the church itself is truth. It says that it it is a pillar and shield. It, it's purpose is to take what is already established truth and to defend and uphold it. It, de it doesn't define what truth or what scripture actually is. And plus, if you're drawing from a, a writing that you're trying to prove has some type of authority, you're actually employing circular reasoning because you're using the church to define what the scriptures are, but then you're also trying to um, use the scripture to give the authority to the truth. So you're using A to prove B and then B to prove A. So there's no real reason to use the church as an authority or as the ultimate authority to what the canon of scripture is, which is why I like Dr. Kruger's self-authenticated model, where you can actually just look to the scriptures and if the Holy Spirit is moving you, you can know it's certain the what books are scripture and what aren't. Yeah, I, I love that. Kruger's model, I think, is perfect to uh, encapsulate what, what really Christians have been saying for a long time now. And I think it's he wants to say something like, uh, look, you don't need to go through these sort of series of inferences and so forth to know that God's speaking to you in these books. In fact, just by being immediately aware of them, reading them, meditating on them, you, you can actually know that God's speaking to you, which I, I, I think is much better than like the sort of Catholic looking through the pages of uh, different you know, church father canons and hoping out that they all agree or something. Right. And, you know, and when I was talking with both Michael Lofton during my Reason and Theology interview, as well as my debate against Trent Horn last year, one of the things I immediately brought up was the Council of Trent. And I said, and the reason I brought that up for is because the Council of Trent left the canon open. And this is something that a lot of Catholics and even Protestants are not aware of. They defined what the scriptures are, what they believe was considered God-breathed scripture. But they didn't say that these are the only books that will ever be part of the Bible. Right. Because as we know, the Eastern Orthodox, they embrace, they have actually have a bigger Old Testament canon that includes Third Ezra's, Third and Fourth Maccabees, Prayer Manessa, and others. So in the event, and Trent brought, flushed this out in the debate, and he even said, well, in the future, it's theoretical that if the Orthodox ever come back to the Catholic Church and they merge together and they want to bring their books back, because these books are books of antiquity and they, they've been around and, and what they were used even as scripture in the early church um, as well as ju early Judaism that the Catholic Church could allow them to bring the books back and, and they would be they would consider them to be inspired scripture and I'm, I'm and that just floored me because it's like so in other words what you're saying that you don't know what books are actually in the Bible that are considered God breathed and, and which aren't 
including the magisterium of the Catholic Church, which is supposed to be your ultimate authority? Yeah, I think that is probably a serious flaw. And uh, they bring it up themselves often, like you mentioned. And to me, that's just, that's not a positive. I wouldn't bring that up, to be honest. It's not a good selling. Oh, we don't even know what the, those books are, even though, you know, they handed those down. It's been, it's the tradition. It's there. You just, it's, you know, it's mythical, you know, it's like steam. You, you try to grasp it, but you never really do. So I'm, <laughs> yeah. I've been thinking, you know, like maybe my mother's got, uh, you know, the a manuscript of infallible cosmopolitan upstairs that we really need the Catholic Church to take a look at. It just, to me, it makes canon so arbitrary. It's whatever, mm-hmm. what church at what age decides, which is just so implausible. Uh, you know, well. You know what? I, I think we should uh, start off with the. Uh, well, actually, I'll let you finish your thought there. I, I think you had an idea there. No, I was actually going to go into something a little more uh, deep because I because one of the things that I wanted to really draw on was um, the New Testament because the, the the thing that Catholics and Protestants actually agree on are the twenty seven New Testament uh, books. In you know, so, and so far as they don't change that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just so far, they they might say, well, we kind of like the Didache, or we kind of like the Shepherd of Hermas, or the Epistle of Barnabas. So, you know, we're, we're, we we might, or you know, we really like First Clement, you know. So, um, and First Clement, you know, is mentioned, you know, Clement's mentioned in Paul's Epistle, so we could add that. So, you know, that's always possible, I guess. <laughs> oh yeah, the the the, leg- uh, the tradition of the Phoenix convinces me. I think it belongs in there, definitely. <laughs> yeah, that's why in chapter 10 of my book, I waited to the very end before I started addressing uh, those books, because I knew one of the arguments that was going to be made is, well, you know, if the Catholic Church got the Old Testament wrong, how can, how can you say they got the New Testament right? And I wanted to bring up the, the arguments against those early books from the first and early century second century why they can't be scripture because they're disqualified for a lot of the same reasons the seven apocryphal apocryphal books in catholic old testaments are because they have they have clear errors and contradictions not only with previous you know scripture uh, but recognized scripture but also they have historical errors as well yeah and that's a good method to determine which books are correct except when you're talking about fish gut and other issues then contradictions historical errors they they don't matter it's it's not history so yeah i I, i'm glad you brought that up because my friend um jeff robinson him and i were talking on his youtube channel agoy for jesus and we and and when i had my debate against trent horn he came up with that fish guts thing and if you watch the debate you see me smirk and i'm like oh that's jeff (laughs) and um and trent just really fell for it i mean like i said he didn't really understand what the argument was because he was trying to compare it to Jesus um, spitting on the ground, and creating mud and putting it on the eyes, and then you know he's cured of blindness. But what Trent doesn't understand, and I even I even talk with him, you know, he, Jesus doing that, and perf- it, when he's doing that, he's specifically performing a miracle. There wasn't anything special, you know, about the spit or about the the mud or anything like that. He was performing a miracle to to confirm his deity, because just as G, uh, just as God had created. Um, uh, man out of the ground, uh, out of the mud. Uh, likewise, you know, J- Jesus is b- breathing or uh, using the mud to put a new eye or create new eyes, you know, for this blind man. You know, so it's affirmed that not only is deity, but he was the promised Messiah from the Old Testament. But, you know, but in the case of the fish guts, the specific wording, and I got this from the U.S. Catholics Bible online, when the angel Raphael supposedly is talking with Tobit in the in the apocryphal book of Tobit, uh, Tobit asks him, "Well, what are these fish guts? What's the medicinal uh, purpose of them and use for?" And Raphael says, "Well, the medicinal purpose is, is to scare away demons if you burn them, and the medicinal purpose is also um, that if you gut the fish, then directly take the guts and and." wipe it on the eyes and then blow on it it'll it'll cure blindness and Trent tried to get around this by saying well in the in, in the ancient days you know they had actually used fish gods to try to cure blindness and of course and that's not the whole story and it's like yeah but these these supposed stories about fish guts doesn't say gut the fish and directly apply it on eyes I mean you you can use all there there have been all kinds of medicinal um, 
remedies where it's taken and then it's turned into some type of salve and everything, but you don't gut it and put it directly on the eyes. And that's why I asked Trent, I says, when's the last time that you gutted a fish and directly applied it on a person's eyes for a medicinal purpose? And Trent, if you noticed, he made a joke out of it saying it wasn't part of his in, you know, insurance plan. You know, and it was just a way of him getting around it because he, because I think Trent knew that he was caught. Right. Yeah. I I was kind of shocked by that reply. I'm like, okay, so you just, well, on the one hand, I he plays off the sympathies of a Protestant with harmonization. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, you just have to kind of grant those sorts of things. You know, maybe that there's like some scientific reason or or something further that you don't know about. But it seems like in cases like this, we have good reason to doubt that there is reasons for harmonization. And especially when we are the Protestants coming and saying, look, we don't accept these books. So, so um, it, it's really your burden to show that these harmonizations aren't merely just ad hoc throwaways. Right. Right. Because like I said, I mean, there, there are some more difficult passages that are in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament, but there's, they still could be harmonized. Some are easier to harmonize than others, but they can still be harmonized, and that's the point. You cannot harmonize, um, like I says an angel saying that the medicinal purpose and method of curing blindness is gutting a fish and directly applying it on the eyes, or saying in Judith that Nebuchadnezzar was king of the Assyrians and he ruled in Nineveh, when in reality um, Nebuchadnezzar was king of the Babylonians. And I tried to look even in secular literature, and there were other Nebuchadnezzars, but every one of them were kings of uh, Babylon or Neo-Babylon. Even Baruch, which is part of the Apocrypha, correctly identifies him as king of Babylon. The only place you find him being king of the Assyrians is in Judith. Yeah, it just felt like he was stripping away one of the critical methods that the church has always used, you know, ironically, something that goes back into antiquity, the method of just contradiction and historical error. Yeah, and this is and the and the way they get the Catholics will get around this is saying, well, this is not a real error, you know, these are apparent errors, you know, that you know, God can reconcile these errors, you know, in his eternal mind, you know, and I'm and I'm perfectly comfortable with not being able to reconcile them, but there's a difference between there being a Bible difficulty that might be difficult to reconcile versus something that's clearly a contradiction. I mean, because there are things that even God can't do. I mean, God cannot lie. He cannot speak of a name above himself. He cannot create a square circle because that would be illogical, and, and God is a logical deity. Um, you know, and he, you, you cannot reconcile um, some of the, a lot of the errors that are in the Apocrypha. Right, from uh, historical, scientific, and whatsoever to, let's say, uh, theological errors. So I, right, you I, know, and, 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 the cl- and the closest that Trent could come to, because I listened to his post-debate interview with Gary, I, mu- I must have really struck a chord, because three days after we had our debate, the three of them are having a <laughs> post-debate interview on it. And the closest that he could come to, you know, another example is like, well, you know, atheists will say that Genesis 1 contradicts Genesis 2. And that's not even a good example because all you have to do is read Genesis 1 and it talks about the six day creation. And you read Genesis 2, it's talking about what happened in that six days. So if the creation of things in the order are different, it's because Genesis 2 is focusing on what was being created and, and taking place in the sixth day. It's not talking about what took place you know, during the creation week. Right, yeah, there's, um, I forget what uh, like someone like John Curid said, but it's like a narrowing down of the perspective from sort of right. this cosmic one to more local in the garden. Exactly, exactly. So I think um, the place where we should really start, I guess, in my mind, would be the earliest evidence for the Protestant or, you know, Catholic canon. This would be with, I suppose, the Old Testament, whether there's like consistency, you know, inconsistencies between you know, like we mentioned, historical errors and so forth, but also in the first century with Philo and uh, people like that, or Aramaic Targums and so forth, what is the evidence that the Protestant canon is the correct Old Testament canon rather than the Catholic? Right. Well, a lot of it comes down to what the boundaries of the Jewish Old Testament canon was, because if you read Romans chapter 3, verse 2, the Apostle Paul specifically states that uh, God had entrusted the Jews with the oracles of God, the oracles of God being the Old Testament scriptures. And there's two ways that we know this, or three ways. 
uh, one, the term, the Greek term oracles is used in the Septuagint to describe some of the Old Testament books like Habakkuk and, and Zechariah and I think Haggai. And when Paul continues writing in Romans chapter 3, he goes on and immediately quotes from the book of Psalms. So we know that is one of the oracles. Then he quotes Isaiah. Then he quotes the Psalms extensively and describes this as the Law and the Prophets. And the Law and the Prophets is a term to describe those Old Testament books. Um, and when you read uh, Luke chapter 24, I think verse 44 and 45, uh, Jesus uses this threefold division that is similar to the threefold division that's in Jewish Old Testament when you refers to the Law, the Prophets, um, and the Psalms as being the, the Scriptures. And when you read Philo, you brought Philo up in his, um, in his work, Complicative, uh, I forgot what it's called, and he uses the same terminology, and he refers to the Law, the Prophets, as, as the oracles of God, and then he says the Psalms and the rest of the books. And this is a way we know that the term Psalms that Jesus is using is doesn't refer specifically or singly just to the 150 Psalms in the Old Testament, but is sort of a metonym or a term that's used to encompass the third division of the Old Testament. You know, so it's it's very similar wording. And we know that there is a three division Old Testament as far back as the time of Sirach, because Sirach, which is part of the Apocrypha uh, that was written around 180 BC, uh, his grandson had around 120 BC written a forward to it, and he talks about the three divisions the Law, the Prophets, and, and the rest of the books of their ancestors. And the New American Bible, not to be confused with the New American Standard, the New American Bible is a Catholic translation. In the footnotes, it states that this, this what, what um, Sirach's grandson is talking about is the same threefold division that is in Protestant Old Testament state that's in the, that's in the Hebrew Bible today. And the New American Bible is... is um, says that it's a that it's the latest complete catholic translation and it is um from the patronage of the bishop's committee on the confraternity of catholic doctrine and the only reason i bring this up for is because it's the the new american bible is is an authoritative catholic translation so there's no reason that we sh that catholics should reject it as an authoritative source Right, no doubt, no doubt. And, and it's good to appeal to their own sources because, uh, well, it's hard to question those. So, anyway. With... Yeah, and if you want to talk if you want to talk about even before the time of Christ, you, what you see consistently is a Genesis to Second Chronicles bookends. And it, and it starts all the way back in Nehemiah chapter 9 because what happens is that they're gathering together in assembly. So when you hear Jews and Protestants refer to a great assembly, this is probably what they're referring to. And it was during the time of Ezra. And as we know, chronologically, Nehemiah was the last book written of the Old Testament chronologically. In Nehemiah chapter 9, it says that they are praying and they are writing down what they are talking about. And they begin with Genesis, goes through the Torah, goes through Joshua and Judges, goes through the Old Testament, the Psalms, etc. And the last book that they finish with is Second Chronicles. And we know that Ezra had written, or most likely wrote, First and Second Chronicles, which was originally one book. And he concluded by re, uh, writing the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And as Gary Machuda had mentioned, that there's a possibility that that Ezra and Nehemiah was originally attached to Second Chronicles. And you can kind of see that at the beginning of Ezra because it begins with the last two verses of Second Chronicles. And when you get into the intertestamental period, that 400 years of silence, Third Ezra's, which was a separate writing that was that was later in the councils of Hippo and Carthage, they actually be, it actually begins with the last two chapters of Second Chronicles. So there's a real good possibility that, that it would have been considered either on one scroll or considered to be like, you know, one collection of writings. And then again, we talked about Sirach, the threefold division. And what's interesting, if you read chapters 44 to 49 of Sirach, um, it begins with Genesis and it ends with Second Chronicles when it when it talks about you know all the books that are in there, and then right up to even the um, second century, there's a there's a Hebrew there's a Jewish writing called Baba Bathra 14b and it was a Breda or a written tradition, and it 
it lists all the books that are uh, considered in the, in the Jewish Old Testament, and it begins with, it actually begins with the five books of Moses, but then it enumerates starting with Joshua, and it ends with Second Chronicles. And it says, the rabbin said, or the rabbi said, it literally means the master said, and this was a term that was first born by Gamaliel I in the first century. And as we know, Gamaliel I was the mentor of the Apostle Paul, and they were both Pharisees. And we know the Pharisees had the same books that are in Protestant Old Testaments today, so this, this um, Genesis to Second Chronicles bookends argument it is found before the time of Christ, during the time of Christ, and even well into the church age. And in fact, Jesus himself even uses these bookends in Matthew chapter 23 and Luke 11. And do Catholics often challenge what the canon, usually they present that there's going to be different canons and they try to play the ambiguity game. But there seems to be, from what you're saying, from Philo, Josephus, uh, Aramaic Targums, and possibly Qumran, right, uh, from all these sources, mm -hmm. a solidified canon that we know that at least, let's just grant, like, say for the sake of argument, that the Pharisees would have been using, which would have definitely, uh, obviously, outlooked on Paul's usage. Yeah, yeah. So, so what's your question? So, just given that we know what the Pharisees' canon would have been, does it even say there even was a plethora uh, or a select different groups with small canon? It's, okay. It seems that there would have been at least around what we know Paul would have probably been using a solidified perspective on what the Old Testament was. Right. Yeah. And I think there's Beckwith actually has um, good arguments for for um arguing that, you know, the, the Jews as a whole, Sadducees, Pharisees, whoever, you know, embrace the, the same books. But for sake of argument, let's say that there was a plethora, like you said. Well, if you go to Luke chapter 16, and, and this is a, a main argument I make in my book, he's actually talking with the Pharisees, and elsewhere it says that they knew that he, he was talking about them. And he said that the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John the Baptist, referring to the Old Testament. And he goes on and tells about this parable of a rich man and Lazarus who die and end up in Hades, and and um, and uh, the rich or the the poor man is you know at Abraham's bosom. And at the very end of the parable, uh, the rich man says to Abraham, "Oh, please, you know, send Lazarus back, you know, to warn my brothers." And we know that his brothers are and, and the rich man are are represented by the Pharisees because Luke specifically states they were lovers of money. And he says, "Well, if they want to avoid Hades." have them read Moses and the prophets because they have Moses and the prophets and and the Greek word for have is the Greek word echo it's transliterated you know for our word echo like when you yell into a well or into a cave and your exact words echo back to you and that's essentially what he's saying he's actually affirming the Old Testament canon of the Pharisees as being the complete Old Testament canon and then when you go back into Matthew chapter 23 and Luke 11 he, taught, he, he rebukes the Pharisees, saying that if you had lived in the days of your forefathers, you would have murdered the prophets too, even though you, um, you, you celebrate and, and decorate you know, their, you know, their tomb, tombs. And he says that you had killed, that, that you'd killed the, all of the prophets from the righteous able to, the, to, to uh, Zechariah, the son of Berechiah. And some people will think, well, when he says... Um, that they killed um, Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, that the Pharisees themselves did. But in, the, in context, when you read the passage, he's equating them with, you know, the, with, the, with their um, spiritual forefathers. So it was their spiritual forefathers who had killed Abel and killed Zechariah. And, the, and of course, we know who Abel was because he's in the first book of the Bible. At, at the beginning of human history, it was the first martyr. But the question is, who is this Zechariah? Now, in my book, I try to respond. I, I use the argument about the, that son doesn't necessarily mean uh, immediate um, biological um, son. It could mean ancestor, because Matthew uses it earlier when he talks about Jesus being the son of David. And even if he was talking chronological, that it was, this, it was Zechariah that's mentioned that, you know, that wrote the Old Testament book in Zechariah 1.1, 1, 1. Um, well, he's last mentioned in Nehemiah, which would be chronologically be the last book of the Bible. But there's actually a better um, argument that it's actually referring to, to the son of Jehoiada I, from Second Chronicles. Are you familiar with um, Z.H. Chaz and his rabbinic name conflation argument? No. 
Mm. Only actually, yeah, and you want... actually, from what you brought up in your debate, I remember the name conflation. I don't know anything of the specifics of the original writing. Yeah, yeah, and that's okay because most people don't know about it. And honestly, as of like six months ago or about a year ago, I didn't really know a whole lot about it either. But Beckwith brings up in his book, Z.H. Chaz, he lived in the 19th century, and, and he was a Jewish theologian and historian and you know, work referred to as the student's guide through the Talmud. And he gave a lot of examples in early rabbinic literature where a rabbi would purposely conflate the name of two people who had similar characteristics or even like the same, even like the same name. And uh, I'm trying to think, is it like, for instance, um, they would conflate um, the wives of Abraham as being the same people like uh, Ketra and Hagar or Ketra and Sarah um, or the two Annas that are mentioned in Genesis chapter 36 who are, were actually uncle and nephew, but they're conflated as being the same person. Uh, the Mishnah, uh, Pethulia, is conflated with Mordecai, and even in the Targums that you had mentioned, uh, Melchizedek and Shem are, are recognized and conflated as being the same person. And what rabbinic name conflation, again, is where a writer or speaker purposely conflates the name of two people with similar attributes, actions, or even the same name. And Beckwith argues that um, in what is it in in Matthew chapter twenty three when he refers to the the Zechariah the son of Berechiah he's purposely conflating him with um, Zechariah the son of Jehoiada because they had similar characteristics they were both prophets in rabbinic literature they're, they're both considered priests and they're also believed to have been um, in rabbinic literature they're conflated to have been martyred on the same day and they were martyred in the same place between the temple and um and the, and the altar and this isn't the first time that jesus had done this because in mark chapter 2 verse 26 he conflates abiathar the high priest with abimelech even though um it, it he's his he's actually his father they're not the same person um in psalm 34 in the prelude abimelech is conflated with King Ashes from First Samuel of chapter 21. So there's lots of examples of this name conflation. And some people will say, well, maybe Jesus is just talking about chronologically the prophets from the Old Testament era. Well, if it was chronologically, Zechariah would not be the last martyred prophet because uh, both, actually Catholics, Protestants, and Jews all agree that um, John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet which was martyred. You know, not not Zechariah, because some people say, well, maybe it's talking about his father. You know, Zechariah that's mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, but he even if he was martyred, he would have been martyred chronologically before John the Baptist, so that doesn't work. And he can't even refer to um, uh, the Hebrew Bible chronologically because the son of Jehoiada wasn't the last uh, prophet that was murdered chronologically. It, it would have been. I think um, Uzziah, that's mentioned in the book of Jeremiah, he was he was martyred um, several kings' reigns later. You know, af after the son of Jehoiada, and it couldn't and it could not be referring to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, that's mentioned in Nehemiah, because there's no record of him ever being martyred. And we know this because, unlike before the Babylonian captivity, when the Israel was murdering its own prophets after the Babylonian captivity. They weren't murdering th their own prophets. They had other problems like complacency, but they did not murder their own prophets. But if Jesus is drawing from an already set canon with Genesis being the first book and Second Chronicles being the last book, then he would have been um, drawing from the set canon, and he would and he would have been referring to the son of Jehoiada because. Canonically, Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, would have been that last prophet in the last book of the Jewish canon, which would have been Second Chronicles. And, and it fits really well with Jesus' argument that, would, that they've been doing this kind of, their spiritual forefathers have been doing this spanning all of kind of history, right? Right, exactly. And, and the only way Jesus' comments make any sense is if he is drawing canonically. And you had mentioned about the Targums. Well, there was a uh, targum called a uh, targum of lamentations. I'm sure you're familiar with that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, Dr. Christian Brady, who again, my friend Jeff Robinson, he's got a video on his YouTube channel, A Goy for Jesus, and 
he had mentioned that he was in correspondence with Dr. Brady, who, who actually translated this Aramaic Targum of Lamentations into English. And, and, and in the Targum, it says it refers to um, Zechariah, this, this Zechariah is, is the, as the son of Edo. And as we know, Zechariah, who wrote the book of Zechariah, is sometimes referred to as Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo. And Dr. Brady says either this was a mistake by the Targums or he's open to the possibility that this, this Targum, which would have been written before the time of Christ, is using the same name conflation um, that, um, that Beckwith argues you know, for that uh, rabbis would use. So when the Targum is saying Zechariah, the son of Edo, he's actually talking about Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, not Zechariah, the son of Berechiah. And that would make sense because why would the Targum of Lamentations be talking about a prophet who wasn't even born yet, referring to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah? It only makes sense if he's using this name conflation to talk about um, Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, because it would have been in that time period. Yeah. So, and I, and I, know, I know this can get like really confusing when we're, we're, we're talking about all this stuff, and that's why I tell people, encourage people to you know, write the book or contact me or whatever. And, and, and sometimes just reading it, you know, on the pages is, is a lot more um, understandable and easier than even uh, speaking. Oh yeah. Like sort of diagramming all the uh, various arguments that will go into it. So uh, we have this one from uh, Jesus's statements. And then um, there was the mentioning of a uh, Paul's statement about the oracles of God. So definitely for anyone get the book because there's a lot of content here. That goes into various different issues. You're talking about extra biblical lit literature. You're talking about biblical literature, and then furthermore, you'll—I mean, just in the first century alone. Then you'll go beyond that into <laughs> to the the issue of church fathers, and then councils, and then so it's definitely uh, it's um, let's say multifaceted to say the least. Yeah, and like I said, even when it comes to the identification of Zechariah, there was a second century writing called the Gospel of the Nazarenes. Obviously, it's not inspired it's not part of the new testament but in it the zechariah that jesus is talking about even this um um this false gospel you know the second century gospel identifies him as being the son of jehoiada from second chronicles and what's interesting if you get a catholic bible like the new catholic version or the new american bible and you look at the footnotes and the cross references they identify the Zechariah that Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 23 as being Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada from Second Chronicles. And when I spoke with Father Mitch Pacwa from EWTN, I asked him about this, and, and he agreed and conceded that Jesus was using this name conflation and that he was drawing from the Pharisaic Old Testament. I was, I was shocked when he brought that up, but he actually, he actually admitted to that. I was glad that you recorded it. I think it's on a goy for uh, Jesus's uh, channel as well, right? Yeah, it's on. It's on that one. Yeah, cause it, yeah. Like he he actually made a much more clear and professional uh, one than I did. Mine was pretty much I recorded into the screen and then and then I gave EWTN credit for it. <laughs> oh no problem. Uh, no, I loved it, I, and especially for someone who's like respectable, like Mitch Pacwa. Uh, mm -hmm. Is definitely a scholar to say the least. So. Absolutely, but but there's just so much evidence for the for the the Protestant Old Testament being the same canon that Jesus and the apostles, um, you know, embraced. You know, and and the whole reason why Catholics will say that, um, you know, they embrace these other books is because they believe that they use the Septuagint, and the Septuagint today has these these seven extra books in it. But what they're doing is that they're anachronistically assuming and placing these books into the same version of the Septuagint in Jesus' day. But that's just an assumption that can't be proven. And even the apostles did not consider the Septuagint necessarily to be inspired because even they deviated from time to time. Matthew deviated from Hosea and used his own Old Testament translation or Greek translation when quoting it. And the apostle Paul deviated from the Septuagint when he quoted Zechariah both in his gospel and the book of Revelation. In fact, he deviated from it the same way in both books, which is another reason why we can be certain that John wrote the gospel and, and, and the apocalypse. Yeah, actually this is going to fit in with my next question, which is going to be okay. do, uh, does Old Testament manuscripts bear out the pr Protestant canon? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, you're talking about like some of the fragments that we found yes. and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it, it's kind of interesting because um, the fragments that we have found from the second century BC to the first century AD, the only fragments that we've found are the books that are in the Hebrew Bibles. Like, for instance, um, we found fragments of Deuteronomy as well as the other books, you know, from the Torah. We found Job, we found Psalms, and, and we haven't found all of them, you know, as far as fragments are concerned. But the only books, uh, Septuagint fragments that we found from the second century BC to the first century AD are the books that are in the Hebrew Bible. Now, one of the arguments I think that Gary Machud and even Trent Horn made was about this um, Kaige recension. And this is something that's been advanced by Albert Sundberg that um, Pharisees uh, in the turn of the first century BC to the first century AD had included um, the book of Baruch, that they, they added the book of Baruch and the, and the Greek translations of, um, of um, Daniel, the, the, the extra books. Um, but there's several problems with this argument. First of all, this took place in, in Egypt. It didn't take place in Israel. Um, second of all, it was only one book in the Greek editions. It, it, it didn't include all seven of the books, so it's kind of a moot point. And even if they did include these books, that doesn't mean that they consider these books as scripture no more than uh, Matthew and John consider the Septuagint to be inspired. Plus, if you look into the first, you know, from the second century AD on, there were different versions of the Septuagint. It was, it's actually better to refer to it as Septuagenta, plural. Because, um, as I mentioned in my book, the discovery at Oxyrhynchus uh, found 23 um, 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 copies of the Septuagint and one old Latin, which was before the, the Vulgate. And it included Third Esdras, Song of Solomon's, uh, or so, yeah, the Psalms of Solomon, Prayer of Manasseh, Psalm 151, and, and several other books that aren't in Catholic Old Testaments today. So, in other words, the apostles were not Septuagint only Jews. You know, they 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 quoted from the Septuagint probably eighty percent of the time or so, uh, but they also used other Greek translations. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they, if there were any other books that were in the Septuagint in their day, they didn't consider them in Scripture. Because if they did, they would have used terms like "It is written," "Have you not read?" "The Scriptures say," "The Law and the Prophets." And there's about 300 of these metonyms used in the New Testament. 100% of them come from books from the Hebrew Bible, none of them from the Apocrypha. So I'm really glad that you mentioned the, the Septuagint uh, thing, because uh, Peter Williams disillusioned me of that uh, idea a couple of years ago, that there's this magical one Septuagint. That yeah. I, I, is that the same source you built uh, that from? Um, I think I might have actually got that from McDonald, believe it or not. I do cover it in my book because it's under the chapter of the Septuagint. And, you know, one of the things that I mentioned is that there wasn't there wasn't just one set Septuagint. You know, there are multiple versions of it. And even when you get to the fourth century um, and you take a look at those councils, like I said, third Esdras was in uh, the Septuagint in Jerome's day, you know, and he and he drew from it. And it would have been in the um the councils of Hippo and Carthage and possibly even in, in the earlier council of Rome. And when you read the early church fathers, they actually preferred it. A lot of them preferred it because it was believed to be an earlier Greek translation than the single book of Ezra and Nehemiah. The, the confusion comes from the name conflation, because when you look at the Council of Florence in 1441 and the Council of Trent in 1546, they say first and second Ezra's, and it refers specifically to the Greek translation of Ezra and the Greek translation of Nehemiah, respectfully. That's what first and second Ezra's were. But in the councils of Hippo and Rome, that's not how the nomenclature was. Ezra was third Ezra's, and second Ezra's was the Greek translation of Ezra and Nehemiah, which was originally one book. This is how the fourth century councils broke them down because they would have been going by either the Septuagint and or the Old Latin, and, and Third Esdras was in both of these, um, the Greek and Latin translations. And, but Jerome realized that um, that's not how the Jews broke these books down. I mean, he, he knew that they considered them to be one book, but I believe in his Latin Vulgate, he may have actually broke 
first Ezra's down to be Ezra, and second Ezra's down to be Nehemiah, from, from my understanding. Gotcha. So for ca- Catholics' arguments, for the addition of the Apocrypha, or Deuterocanonical books, into the Old Testament canon, I remember in your debate with Trent Horn, he had two arguments. One was that Hebrews 11.35 quotes 2 Maccabees 7, and Wisdom 2's prophecy. Yeah. So um, let's break down the first one. What's your, uh, well, if you have any thoughts on it. Yeah, we, we can break them down individually. You know, I'll give my thoughts, and then just to remind me, you know, because I'm getting older on my memories of what it used to be. And you can just, you know, say, okay, how about this next one? You brought, bring the next one on. So you want to start with Hebrews? Yes. Okay. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11. This is a um, supposed to be a silver bullet by Gary uh, Machuda. And he says, while the writer of Hebrews is Hebrews 11, he's citing from um, 2 Maccabees uh, chapter 6 and 7 when he talks about those that have been uh, tortured, you know, and all that. Well, couple things. First of all, there's no evidence that that they're quoting it specifically as scripture. That's probably the most obvious thing. Because in this passage, it doesn't say, as the scriptures say, or it is written, and then, and then quotes it. He's using more of a general statement because there are a lot of Jews in the Old Testament era outside of 1st and 2nd Maccabees that were tortured for their faith. I mean, I mean look at Daniel and, and how they were thrown into the furnace by Nebuchadnezzar. And even if it is um, quoting from Second Maccabees, which I believe that it is. Again, they're not quoting it as scripture with one of these terms. Now, Gary has said that I used it is attested for or attested to in my book as one of these metonyms. But he's demonstrating he doesn't understand how a metonym work. A metonym being a term to introduce an Old Testament scripture, like it is written. But the term it is attested, depending on the context tells you um, whether or not it's quoting an Old Testament passage or if it's talking about, it's attesting to the uh, faith of those during the Old Testament era, not necessarily an Old Testament scripture. And Hebrews chapter 11 begins by talking about the the faith of those that it was attested to. But I think it's in in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 2, but when it says that it was attested of them, it doesn't quote the Old Testament scripture. Now, in verse 3 or 4, it does, but then it immediately uh, quotes the Old Testament scripture. That so, so here the writer of Hebrews is using the word attested to in two different ways. In, in, chapter, in verse 2, he's, not, he's simply using it as, as an attestation of their faith. And in verse, I think, 3 or 4, he's using it and then quoting and introducing an Old Testament uh, passage. To give you an example, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 5, when Jesus says, it is written that man shall not live by bread of bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, he's using it as a metonym. He's introducing an Old Testament passage, and he's saying this is scripture. This is an Old Testament scripture. Um, but when the Apostle John says that it was written in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, when he's looking at the sign that's above Jesus' cross, he's obviously not using the word written to describe an Old Testament scripture, he's using the word differently. You know, so the Hebrews chapter 11, when it talks about those that were tortured, um, it's not using the term, it is, a, it is attested um, as an Old Testament metonym. Gotcha, yeah, in my experience with Catholics that kind of use this kind of argumentation, it's mm-hmm. it's usually, so the, there's, there's two things that usually always occur. One will, it, it, it'll, it'll either be that it might allude to such a passage, but it actually has an Old Testament passage in mind. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, or what's, what's the other thing? Wow, my memory shot too. Uh, oh, it's not just—it's not just you then. Good, yeah. <laughs> I feel better now. You made, you made my day. Oh no, problem. Yeah, I'm young though, so it's worries for me. This shows you that it's only downhill from here. Um, <laughs> It'll be that, an illusion that really alludes to another uh, Old Testament cha- uh, passage, so they have that in common, or it's just merely an illusion that really makes no difference at the end of the day, I think. Right, right. And the, 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 thing, the t- thing to take away from that passage, it's not citing it as a scripture. He's citing it as things that generally happened in the Old Testament era, even if it comes from an apocryphal book that's not inspired scripture. That's what you can take away from it. It is only when he uses this term in conjunction with the scripture that he's using, that the New Testament writers are using this 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 uh, word to introduce scripture. Gotcha. And the second uh, passage that he brought up was Wisdom 2, 
And I think it was in conjunction with Matthew 27. Yeah, I was actually looking that up while you were talking, and it's specifically Wisdom chapter 2, verse 18. And I'm going to be reading from the New American Bible, which again is a Catholic translation, where it says, For if the just one be the Son of God, he will defend him and deliver him from the hands of his foes. And they'll say, this is a clear passage in Matthew chapter 27, when Jesus is on the cross, and Matthew refers back to this passage. And I argued in my debate against Gary, as well as Trent, that it's and not actually referring back to Wisdom chapter 2, but it's referring back to Matthew chapter 22. And the reason is for is because in both Matthew uh, chapter 27 and Psalm chapter 22, I, I might have said a different book, but it's Psalm chapter 22, um, it actually says he will, he will defend him. Now, the p- part about delivering him from the hands of his foes, the Catholics will say, well, that's not in Matthew chapter 22. But as I brought up, that little bit, that's not in Matthew chapter 27 either. Wisdom is actually referring back to Psalm 22 and then adding on that appendage that says, deliver him from the hands of his foes. That's not found in Matthew chapter 27 or Psalm 22. You know, so if you take a look at Psalm 22 and compare it to Matthew 27, it's identical. The only thing that's different is about referring to him as the, Jesus as the Son of God. Well, you can find Jesus being the Son of God, that God had a son, back in Matthew chapter 2, which the Apostle Paul even quotes as being the second psalm when he, re, when he correlates Jesus as being the fulfillment of that, as, and as well as back, I think, in First or Second Samuel, um, when it's talking about, um, you know, about the descendant of David or the descendant of, of Solomon um, having a son that will sit on his throne, which, again, the New Testament references as being... Um, a fulfillment of Jesus. I think it's in, actually in Hebrews chapter one or two. You know that it's that it references that. You know, so wisdom chapter two is referring referencing back to Psalm twenty two and adding that little appendage that's not in Psalm twenty two. And Psalm twenty two is actually prophesying um, Matthew twenty seven, which is a fulfillment of that prophecy in Psalms, not Psalm chapter two verse eighteen. Yeah, the other thing I figured I'd ask you about was, but I forgot the reference. It was in regards to um, wisdom Christology. They use this kind of as an argument, or like briefly, like how could they get this right? You know, they, it makes it sound like there's a trinity in wisdom literature. Yeah, and I don't think I go on, go into the, my book, but one thing we have to give um, the writers of apocryphal literature, the you know, which were Jewish. Um, credit for is that they had a much more sounder understanding of the Old Testament than even a lot of Christians do today. You know, so they would have had a lot more polished um, uh, ecclesiology, or not ecclesiology, but theology and even Christology than even what's in the Old Testament. I mean, to kind of give a correlation to this, um, we believe that the Trinity is a biblical concept, but you're not going to find the word Trinity in the Old Test or in the Old Testament or the New Testament, the closest you get is like Matthew chapter twenty-eight, nineteen, and Second Corinthians thirteen, verse fourteen. Um, but you're not going to find the Trinity the word Trinity until I think Tertullian is the first one that actually uses the term, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that because he uses a term that we should include Tertullian's writings in, in the New Testament. You know, likewise, just because the intertestamental Jewish writings are more polished. They're more polished because they drew from an already set canon that they were familiar with and they understood was inspired scripture and was able to come up with more specific terminology that you find in the New Testament. But but everything that you can find in these intertestamental books, the concept at least, or at least the seeds of it, you can find in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, I, I was kind of not compelled by that argument, especially in the light of like the works that are, that are being shot out right now by uh, even Jewish scholars, that there was this sort of uh, intertestamental concept of a, a plurality in God, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel like unless you're going to throw, like like they said, a bunch of Aramaic Targums, unless you're going to throw a bunch of them in the canon too, uh, that argument mm-hmm. just doesn't really matter much. No, you know, and even like the Aramaic Targums, if you notice that they were written during you know that period of time, what Targums you know are are are, are were written and, and and translated at that time? It was 
the ones that are found in Hebrew Old Testaments today. And the only ones that weren't, which I think were a couple of them, were were books that were at least partially written, already written in Aramaic. So they may not have felt the need to translate them into Aramaic since they were already in Arama Aramaic. You know, but the other books like the Torah and the prophets and some of the writings were written in Hebrew, so that's why they translated them. And again, the, 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 they're just paraphrases, they're not direct translations, but nonetheless, none of the books from the Apocrypha that are in Catholic Old Testaments were part of these um, these Targums, not even books like Syriac and Wisdom or First or Second Maccabees, the, the ones that you know, are considered to be more authoritative, you know, even in Catholic circles. So I think now I want to ask you about the early church fathers. Do, do they bear yeah. some authority here? Do, where would you say they fit as good evidence for the Catholic or the Protestant? Obviously the Protestant, but why? Right. Well, I'm going to play devil's advocate here with you, Vincent, because um, one of the arguments that's being made by contemporary Catholic apologists is that they'll say, well, the um, early church fathers, yeah, they have these lists you know, that are identical or near identical to Protestant Old Testaments, but we can't go strictly by lists. My first question is, why? why? Why are you setting that as a standard? Because, and they'll say, because they use these other books specifically, you know, as scripture, and so they considered them to be just as authoritative, even if they didn't say, this is the canonical Old Testament. Because in the early church, there was a, they, a lot of them made a distinction between canonical books versus ecclesiastical books that would be written. And and they'll argue for like these three tiers. The first tier are the books of the Hebrew Bible. The second tier are the books of the of the apocryphal or the deuteral canon that Catholics call them. And then there's a third tier that that aren't in any Bibles, you know, that are considered apocryphal or pseudepigraphal. The problem with that argument is that there, there's one obvious argument because they'll say that the reason why they like Melito and Origen are are um, using only these books is because they're using them as a witness, you know, to Jews and saying this was in the Jewish, you know, canon. Well, that kind of opens up a can of worms because since the Jews were entrusted with the Old Testament scriptures, if this included these deuterocanonical books, it would have been part of this proto-canon in this uh, alleged first tier. In other words, if the Jews accepted them, there would be no second tier. The second tier would be part of the first tier. The other problem is when you look at the second tier consistently, no early church father anywhere in the first few centuries lists all seven of the books as being part of the second tier. And no early church father quotes every single one of these deuterocanonical books as being scripture or authoritative. And even in the second tier, there are other books that are, they actually even call scripture. For example, the uh, Epistle of Barnabas in the second century uh, specifically calls First Enoch scripture twice. Irenaeus in the late second century, he quotes from the shepherd of Hermas and quotes it and calls it scripture just as he calls wisdom scripture. And that's another thing with wisdom. In both the Muratorium fragment, which is believed to be written around the second century um, AD, and Irenaeus, they both include wisdom not as part of the Old Testament, but as part of the New Testament. You know, at least say it, and then that's the problem with going with early church fathers. And even as late as the fourth century, um, Athanasius of Alexandria, who is one of the first to actually refer to a collection of books as canon, um, he says when he talks about those books that are to be read, which is part of the second tier, he only includes Wisdom, Syriac, Judith, and Tobit. He does not include first and second Maccabees. They are not part of this first or the second tier. That Athanasius would have actually placed them in this third tier. But in addition to that, he also includes the Didache and the Shepherd of Hermas in this second tier, along with Wisdom, Syriac, Judith, and Tobit. Furthermore, he says in his first tier, which includes just the books of the, of the Protestant Old Testament, he says that doctrine alone should be based on these first tier books, not the second tier. So a bit of solo scripture in there a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I know. I, I you saw that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think ultimately that's probably what they're trying to undermine is you know you can't get the canon from the scriptures alone, but then you got Kruger, so it kind of doesn't really you won't agree with that, and then it doesn't really go far from my experiences. 
No, um, no, and 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 what the uh, and what the canon does, like it says, and Kruger brings this up in his book. Even if there was a list of books that that, that cl- is claimed to be part of the Old Testament canon, you would need an infallible source or another infallible inspired book to validate, you know, this twenty seventh book. You need a twenty eighth book, but then you would need a twenty ninth book to validate a twenty eighth book. So you have this infinite re- regress, you know. So so that's why you know Catholics would never be. Um, happy with even the New Testament saying these are the books of the Old Testament. They would still have to validate the New Testament you know, books. Um, but what we can do is we can glean and discern from the New Testament who had um, the, the correct canon. And Jesus and the Apostle Paul makes it really clear that the Pharisees specifically did. And the reason why we focus on the Pharisees is because we have more um, evidence, and we have a more detailed list of what the books of Pharisees actually accepted prior to and contemporary with the time of Christ than we do other Jewish factions like the Sadducees and the Essenes. Right. Uh, you know, some some groups just ran off of the desert and hung out there, so of course we don't have too much, and, you know, to what influence they would have even really had. Uh, right. It's not even worth searching, you know, or at least for widespread influence. So it seems yeah. like our best bet would be the Pharisaical canon in the first place. Because we have the most information from them. I mean, and even the Essenes, when, when Beckwith does an amazing job of this, where he actually says you know, that, that the Essenes, when they actually took a you know, they, they had this huge collection of books, but books like the Copper Scroll and the War Scroll and the Temple Scroll and everything, even though Temple Scroll they considered to be very authoritarian and everything, they still did not view it at the same level as the books that were in the Hebrew Bible. And people will bring up Esther. Well, Esther's not there. Well, there's as McDonald actually b- brings up, is that they did actually find a book referred to as Proto-Esther, which is sort of maybe like a commentary or, or something on the book of Esther. So we should be really, we should really guard against our belief that the Essenes rejected the book of Esther. In fact, even Trent Horn in our debate said that there was like a wineskin or something that um, talked about Purim. You know, so th- there's a good reason not, to, you know, to believe that they may have actually embraced Esther, um, but we don't really know a whole lot about it. So we really can't use the Essenes as a re- reason for believing there were different canons, um, Jewish canons at that particular time, because um, they viewed books they had and they had the sole collection, but they 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 viewed the books differently. Yeah, and when we find people denying, like, actual denials that Esther's in the canon, like, the reasoning often provided that it's not in the canon is, like, abysmal, like, from my experience. Like, it's, like, as bad as, like, arguments, like, it doesn't mention God or something. Yeah, yeah, cause, yeah because um, it doesn't mention God, but then again, so does Song of Solomon, you can argue, doesn't explicitly mention God. Um, and then there's issues about um, Esther being married to a, to a pagan spouse, but then again, so is King David and, and King Solomon, and then there's a whole issue with with Purim, which we which we've already discussed that. Right. So it, it seems to me like like the early evidence actually is good evidence for the Protestant position, just in the fact that there isn't like as what Trent would say, this is like canonless handed out. We actually find a variety in the first place. So it seems like if Protestantism was true, then you'd find a variety of a uh, canonless. And, and right. I, and, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and this is what Luther actually figured out, too, because, you know, a lot of times people will bring up about Luther flip-flopping on the canon, but Luther, um, you got we have to remember, Luther was, was brought up and educated a Catholic. They didn't have Protestant seminaries and everything back then. All his education came from, from um, Catholic sources. You know, but when, when he went to university and he started studying the New Testament, he started studying the history and everything, and um, once he realized that the New Testament does teach that you're saved by faith, you're justified by faith alone, not faith cooperating with works, he began to study the, can- the issue of the canon a lot more um, seriously, especially when his upcoming debate against Johann Eck took place. And he realized that the Jews of antiquity, they did not accept these books into their canon, these, these seven extra books. So by the time he got to his debate with Eck, this is why he wouldn't allow books like Second Maccabees into the debate that supposedly teaches purgatory, which I don't believe it teaches purgatory the way the Catholic Church does. Um, but he's realized he goes, I'm, I'm not admitting this into the debate because it's not scripture. <laughs> no, that's fair. I, I think uh, we can't take anything for granted, and we have to argue for all our assumptions. Um, yeah, 
Yeah. So for uh, I, I'm glad you you mentioned Luther's uh, historical uh, search into the canon because I think this is gonna this fits along with my next question. In church history, we find kind of the church fathers familiar with the Hebrews and the Jewish Jews would tend towards leaving the Apocrypha out, right? Like uh, Jerome, n- namely Jerome. I, I I can't remember. Did Origen? You mentioned Origen. Did he leave uh, the Apocrypha out? Or? Yes. As a matter of fact, his his list is is virtually identical. The only difference between um, his canon and that of the Jews and the Protestants is, A, he attaches the epistle of Jeremiah as an appendage um, to the book of Jeremiah, which was common to do because it was originally not put part of the book of Baruch. Um, It was added later in in the Latin Bible. And uh, books like, um, or codexes like Codex Amiatitis, and uh, Leon Palimpsest in, in the seventh century A.D. Um, did not include it. It was it was actually an append, appendix, you know, to the book, you know, of Jeremiah. But in Origins list, it's just an appendage, and it doesn't include the minor prophets. But that was either an error on um, Origins part, or possibly Eusebius who preserves it in his church history, because those the minor prophets were never in question by Jews or early Christians because they they show up specifically I think in um in Syriac in, you know they, they refer to to the 12 prophets or the 12 minor prophets and we know that origin wouldn't have in, would have included them because um Hilary of Portier who followed him not only quoted every single book um, that origin quoted he actually quoted them in the exact order except that he placed the minor prophets uh, in front of Isaiah. You know, so that's how we know Origen's list was identical to the Jewish canon. Gotcha. So um, along with that question, so it seems like in early church history, there's kind of a divide between, the, obviously, the church and the synagogue. And that seems to hurt kind of this issue of canon in the early church because what happens is those disconnected with the Jews, they end up having kind of, well, the apocryphal works in their canons where people who tended to be familiar with them didn't. Right. Because, I mean, like Augustine, I bring up Augustine. Augustine, he didn't know Hebrew. He didn't know what books were actually in the Jewish Old Testament. He just assumed that these books actually were. But even Augustine, in some ways, he's kind of a um, witness on our side because he made a distinction in his work on Christian doctrine. He made a distinction between the ecclesiastical books, the church books that were read in the church for edification, and the canonical books, which were strictly the books of the Hebrew Bible. And he also made some other mistakes, like saying that the Jews accepted first and Mac- second Maccabees and, and the church didn't. You know, and he actually, you know, writes this, I believe, in in, in the same work. Um, but yeah, but and a lot of it just has to do with those early church fathers who knew what books were laid up in the temple. And Josephus, who we believe was actually a Pharisee, or at least at one point in his life, he enumerated most of these books that were part of this Old Testament that were laid up in the temple. And they were all books that were from the Hebrew Bible. He doesn't mention every one of them, but what he does do is that he says that the books of their, of his ancestors were enumerated in the 22 books. Now, for Protestants, we have 39 books in the Old Testament, but they're the exact same books because books like Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, Ruth and Judges, First and Second Chronicles were merged together. The 12 minor prophets were considered one books. So our 39 books are the exact same 22 books that are in um, uh, that were in the Jewish Bible that were laid up in the temple. And as we know, the Sadducees, not the Pharisees, were the ones that laid the books up in the temple. And the Sadducees would have not laid up books up in the temple that they didn't consider to be inspired because it was in places like the temple, the tabernacle, and even the Ark of the Covenant that was later placed in the temple is where important inspired books were go. Like, for instance, we know that the five books of Moses was placed in in the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant was placed in the tabernacle and and then later in the temple. So the only books that they would allow in there were books that were considered to be inspired, and there's no way the Sadducees would have included those five extra books that are in Catholic Old Testaments. Yeah, which uh, I think will cast some doubt on the claim, usually, especially of those who debated that tried to limit the Sadducees' canon. Right, and the other thing I wanted to mention, too, is um, 
about Josephus. Uh, and Beckwith, it doesn't bring up my book, but I want to bring it up because it's significant. Josephus would would kind of boast that he was related to the Pharisees on his mother's side. And one of the most famous Pharisees was Judas Armoami. He, he was related to the Maccabees, I'm sorry, on his mother's side. And one of the most famous Maccabees was Judas Maccabeus, who, you know, um, um, took place in the, uh, in, in the uh, revolt against Antiochus Epiphanes. And it talks about, in I think, 1st or 2nd Maccabees, that he had gathered together the books of his ancestors after the war, meaning after this revolution. And this would have taken place around 164 B.C. And since Josephus was a Pharisee, and who was related to the Maccabees, you know, from around the 2nd century B.C., we can say for pretty good certain what books um, Judas would have embraced. It would have been the same 22 books that um, were laid up in the temple that uh, Josephus, who was related to the Maccabees, would have embraced. Gotcha. I guess it's time for we're, the... Go ahead. No, what, what, I, I says wherever you want to go. Yeah, I think... Uh, no, I think... Uh... That is actually, I didn't hear that part before in any of your other, well, debates at least. Uh, maybe you said it with a goy for Jesus, but no, that's definitely interesting. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's what and, makes Jerome's testimony so valuable, and that's why Catholics have to necessarily discredit it. They do. They marginalize Jerome so much, just like they mar marginalize Luther and, and any other church father whose list is, you know, identical or near identical to the Protestant Old Testament. But like I tell people, you know, if Jesus and the apostles embrace the exact same books that are in Catholic Old Testaments today, if they really did, what you would expect to find in the early church age is an identical list that is in Catholic Old Testaments today. You should at least find one. You don't even find one. You, you, even when it comes to like the second tiers, you don't find one. You know, and, and the only list that you see as being the canonical Old Testaments are the ones that are in Protestant Old Testaments today in Jewish Bibles you don't you don't even find one in the early church um that are identical to catholic old testaments and on top of it like like they always say if this tradition really goes back to the apostles that was handed down and so forth then with all this debate even leading into what i think we're going to cover next is the councils yeah that it just puts so much doubt on the testimony that, that yeah, there's always been this one set canon for all time. It may have not have been known by everyone, but eventually at Trent, it was finally revealed. It's almost like a um, revisionist history of some sort. So, exactly. I, I have to ask, uh, so what about the uh, the Council of Rome and things like that? Well, don't they all have the same canon uh, and, you know, vindicate the Roman Catholic position? Yeah, I'm glad you uh, brought that up, and I'm actually looking at on, in my book, it's at page... Um, 76 and 77 specifically with the Council of Rome. One thing we have to understand about this council is that it was headed by um, Bishop Damascus, which was the Bishop of Rome um, in, in 382, and coincidentally it was the same Bishop of Rome who commissioned Jerome to, um, to compile the Vulgate, which he completed in 405. What a lot of people don't know is that Jerome was a key member along with Epiphanius of Salamis, and they both embraced the smaller canon. So whatever was in this 4th century council of Rome would also have to be included in his Vulgate. He, he would have had to uh, be faithful to it. And I'm looking I'm right here, it's, and when in the section where he talks about the prophets, he says the order, this is from the Council of Rome, it says the order of the prophets, and he says, Jeremiah, one book, with Genoth, that is, with his lamentations. Now, if you take a look at a lot of Eastern church fathers, like Cyril and Athanasius, by the 4th century, um, in the East at least, Baruch was actually considered to be part of the book of Jeremiah, because it was believed Baruch was his scribe, and by then they had believed um, incorrectly that Baruch had written this book as well as Jeremiah and Lamentations. We now know historically that it wasn't. It was written much later, even in the, in the um, Dead Sea Scrolls. We find Jeremiah, Lamentations, and the epistle of Jeremiah separate from Jeremiah, Lamentations, but Baruch isn't there. That's how we know that Baruch was written much later. But in the Council of Rome specifically, which is in the West, not the East, it says Jeremiah, one book 
with his lamentations. So that was the book that was actually considered one book. Baruch is not mentioned. And when Jerome, who was a key member of this council, was compiling his Vulgate, he had tried to look for Baruch and the Septuagint because the only Hebrew books that he could find that were written in Hebrew were the books of the Hebrew Bible. He, he had to look to the Septuagint for um, the books for the Deuterocanonical or Apocrypha books, but he couldn't find it. So this is really good evidence that Baruch was not part of this council that Jerome was a key member of. Plus, unlike the later councils of Hippo and Carthage in 393 and 397, the Council of Rome in 382 specifically enumerates every single book individually. Like, you know, they, they mentioned... Um, Isaiah with Jeremiah, they separate uh, Ruth and Judges and, and several other books. Um, so if, since, since Rome was enumerating these books, you would expect if Baruch was part of this canon, um, it would have been enumerated as well, but it wasn't. You know, and that's why it's not found in, in Jerome's Vulgate. Another thing is too, and I bring this up in my book, Jerome Ref, re, reference back to Origins Hexapla, which was a six-column um, book of, of different Hebrew and Greek versions of the Old Testament. And what's funny is that one of these um, uh, translations of the Old Testament was the translation of Aquila. Aquila does not include any of the books of the Apocrypha, including the book of Baruch. So this is one of the reasons we, that we, we know that Baruch wasn't part of it. And the reason this is important is because the, this Council of Rome conflicts with the later councils of Florence and Trent in the 14th and 15th century because it does include Baruch. That's not the only uh, council of that time. What's the other one called? Carthage. There was another, yeah, Carthage. And there was an earlier uh, council of uh, Laodicea that also, um, I don't think, they included most or all of the, uh, um, of, of the, the apocryphal books either. You know, but um, in, in Hippo and Carthage, that's another issue, too, because um, in Hippo and Carthage, it doesn't say Jeremiah and Baruch with lamentations. It just says Jeremiah. And, and so it's a little difficult to know whether or not Jeremiah included um, Baruch or not. We know it included lamentations because it was considered a single book back then. Uh, but if it did include Baruch, then you have um, two fourth century councils that contradict each other on whether Baruch belongs in the Old Testament. If it does include, if it if it doesn't include Baruch and it agrees with Rome, then you've got Hippo and Carthage contradicting uh, Florence and Trent, you know, s centuries later. And on top of it, as we mentioned before, it included this um, this um, pseudepigraphal writing called Third Esdras, which Gary Machuda even conceded to in his debate against James White in two thousand four, and he said that. When the Council of Trent later on was was considering Third Esdras, it says that they passed over in silence this book. Neither, in other words, they didn't say that it was scripture, but it didn't say that it wasn't scripture either. It just passed over in silence. It didn't make a declaration. Well, if the, if the canon was passed down since the time of Jesus, why are you even considering um, Third Ezra is, is being as, as a canonical book. You should know for certain if it is or if it isn't. You shouldn't be passing over in silence. Right, and there seems like there would be something something at least there to, that really gives an indication of such a, a important thing as, as God's own words. Right. I, I think, I'll ask you a question about this later. Uh, it would be how does uh, post-Vatican II doctrine actually affect this debate, given like a uh, uh, the move from Catholics, uh, you know, I think uh, what I'll call is a redefinition of what inerrancy and stuff was. How does that actually play in this debate? Does it play any role at all or uh, such and that? Yeah, well, like I said, Vatican II, what they attempted to do is they, they attempted to soften the relationships between Catholics and Protestants. And what they did is that they actually, I think, ticked off a lot of Catholics because we went from being schismatics and heretics to, to being separated brethren. <laughs> You know, but and as far as the the Vatican II, I don't know if they go specifically into the you know canon on this particular subject. You might know better than I do. Um, but they, you know, they're not going to contradict the, the Council of Trent that said these are the books. But at the same time, they're leaving the door open for these 
extra books to be added later if the Eastern Orthodox ever decide to reconcile with Rome. And again, it's like, how can you not know whether or not these books and only these books specifically are scripture? They're open to the idea that there could be other inspired books out there, you know, in the Eastern Church that God, for some reason, blinded or hid from the Western Church as being an inspired scripture. But then, then that just contradicts the Council of Rome that says that it was handed down, you know, but at the same time, Trent leaves the door open for these books to be added later, so I don't know. Yeah, and that's why I made my uh, statement about, you know, the inspired cosmopolitan. It just seems like Catholics <laughs> are left, you know, floating in free air there because uh, given the development of inspiration, you could have an utterly contradictory work added to the canon, given that the, yeah. the, the redefinition of inerrancy. And it, to right. me, it just hurts. It just hurts one of the oldest criterion we've always used, like I mentioned earlier, the, the criterion of contradiction or historical inaccuracies, or even like something basic, like from the time of the uh, apostles. There's nothing that says that it has to be from those times. So he, they, they can just, I hate to say it, just assert any work is canon, and it seems like there's no limiting principle. Yeah, and this just really draws out the fact of how the difference between how Catholics view the Bible and how Protestants view the Bible. The Protestants have a very high view of the Bible that only that scripture and only scripture is God breathed, and if it's God breathed, it cannot have any mistakes, cannot have any errors in it. And if Jesus and the apostles knew that, what what the boundaries were, then their their um, then the church and their immediate audience you know knew what it actually was. And no Jew that they ever talked to, whether it was the Pharisees or anything else, embraced any of these books as being inspired scripture. And, you know, none of them. Um, but the fact that they leave it open, it, it shows that they have actually a very low view of Scripture um, to the point of um, elevating the, their church, their extra-biblical church traditions, you know, at the level or, or even higher. You know, they'll say, well, you know, the, the church, the Catholic Church is the servant of the Scriptures. Uh, but in reality, if they're the ones that define what Scripture is, they're actually saying that their authority is actually above Scripture, that Scripture itself cannot tell us what is inspired and what it isn't. And in reality, this actually contradicts even the Council of Rome, because I don't cover this in my book, but if you take a look at um, the list of books that Rome, the Council of Rome in 382 embraced, immediately afterwards it says that the Scriptures gave us the Church. In other words, the Church did not give us the Scriptures, so when you hear Catholics say the Catholic Church gave us our Bible, they're contradicting the previous Council of Rome that was overseen and headed by the Bishop of Rome. Yeah, uh, who was the Bishop of, of Rome at the time of the Council of Rome again? Uh, Pope Damascus, well, Bishop Damascus, Damascus I. Damascus. Uh, how, you know, well, how did he become Pope again? Didn't he murder a bunch of people all the way to the, the Pope? I'm sorry I, to bring that up. It just came to mind. No, 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 no. But, well, let, let's be honest, and, and this is something even Catholic apologists, you know, aren't going to shy away from if they're honest. You know, there was a lot of um, bad popes, you know, that were murdering other popes and, and rising to power, and, and there was a, there was a, a lot of. Um, uh, uh, what do you, what do I want to call it? Like when you have your your nephew you know, take a position nepotism, you know that was going on, you know. But as far as like murdering back in the fourth century, I don't know if that really happened that that much because you got to realize they had just it come out of um, Roman persecution, referring to the the Roman Empire, because you know it wasn't until the Edict of Milan that Constantine had made Christianity legal, and it was sometime after that you know, that it became the official um, religion of the Roman Empire. You know, it was sometime after that. You know, and um, things started getting better for the church in 325 when the first ecumenical council of Nicaea convened, which, by the way, did not have anything to do with the formation of their canon. You know, that's a, that's a, um, a, a, a fable, you know, that's, that goes around. So I don't want anybody to think that it had anything to do with it, which it didn't. But what's interesting is when you come to the Second Ecumenical Council of Nicaea, which took place in 787, which I do mention in my book, um, it did it embraced um, the canon from Hippo and Carthage. And the reason this is significant is because unlike Hippo and Carthage, which were local councils, 
The Second Ecumenical Council of Nicaea was an ecumenical council similar to Trent and Florence centuries later. The reason this is important is, is, is if they, since they embrace the the council the books that were in Hippo and Carthage, they embraced Third Esdras, and possibly they didn't embrace Baruch if Baruch wasn't part of Jeremiah. We don't know for sure, but they definitely would embrace um, Second and Third Esdras, and by or the Second Esdras, or First Esdras. I'm sorry, First Esdras. Uh, you know this 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 extra book that's in, not in Catholic Old Testaments today. So we have. Two ecum- you got an ecumenical council, the second uh, council of Nicaea in 787, that embraced Third Esdras, but later ecumenical councils of Florence and Trent who did not embrace Third Esdras. And the reason this is important is because what's in an ecumenical council is binding to the Catholic. You know, so so if it's binding to the Catholic, then you have ecumenical councils that are contradicting each other and this is something that that um, Luther had mentioned at the Diet of Worms in 1521 when he said if you convict me by scripture or sound reason I'll recant what I said but I can't trust in popes and councils alone because they contradict each other because he had just come out of a time period when the Fifth Lateran Council said that a pope was above um, a council and earlier in the Council of Constance, and I believe Pisa, that a council was above a pope. You know, so within a hundred years, they went back and forth. And the reason why Constance had to do that is because they had gotten out of their own papal schism when there was two and even three popes that were vying for power. You know, so, and Luther knew all this because he was an educated man. Yeah, it, it, good thing he lived on the. He didn't live too far away from those events, so they actually hit close to home. And those absolutely. And those years debating conciliarism is mm-hmm. just another. I want to just throw another log on the fire of doubt <laughs> for like these these yeah. extraordinary papal claims. Um, yeah, and it's and it's kind of funny because the whole second Nicaea thing. I actually I actually found out after I wrote the book because. Um, I was listening to William Albrecht, who is a contemporary of Gary Machuda, and he made the comment, it's like, oh yeah, the 4th century councils, you know, they, they might have been local councils, but they had the stamp of approval by the popes, and the second, second Nicaea affirmed, you know, these lists. And it's like, well, wait a minute, if they affirmed the lists of Hippo and Carthage, the second Nicaea, which was an ecumenical council, affirmed Hippo and Carthage, then they're affirming a canon that's different than the later ecumenical con- councils of Florence and Hippo, uh, Florence and Trent. So, William, you just... Um, stated that two ecumenical councils contradict each, each other, which are universal councils. Right, it definitely puts a hole in your boat. Um, mm-hmm. So, so uh, I think, so we discussed um, the difficulties of whether Jeremiah included Baruch. Uh, we mm-hmm. talked about the Ezra's. Now, my, I, I assume the third thing would be whether those councils included uh, the book of Revelation. Yeah, and, and, and where what I brought up was the fact that in the late 4th century, the book of Revelation was questioned, even as late as that, which is ironic because Revelation was actually accepted very early at Rome. You know, and But as time went on, because the, uh, the Montanists, which w- was a heretical sect, began actually using the book of Revelation unbiblically, a lot of churches, particularly in the East, would reject it. For example, the Council of Laodicea um, supposedly rejected it. Some people say that the 60th um, canon of Laodicea didn't include it. It was it was anachronistically you know put in later, but it was a Eastern Church, so it most likely rejected Revelation. Cyril of Jerusalem um, did not include it in his list. There was something called the Apostolic Constitutions that were written around 397 to 400 A.D., right around the time that the Council of Carthage um, didn't include it. And as I mentioned before. Lee Martin McDonald, who uh, wrote a, a vast book on uh, the Bible canon or the biblical canon, said not once but twice that Carthage did not include it, which is why uh, the Council of Carthage in 419 in the next century had to add it back in. Uh, Michael Lacona has, has um, men- mentioned that it didn't include it. And I think Brian Litvin from um, Moody who wrote a book, um, Getting to Know the Church Fathers and Evangelical Introduction, also mentioned that it was not in it. Um, but regardless of whether or not it was in it or not, 
is not the issue. The issue is the fact that these local councils, even if Revelation was in it, these local councils didn't have the same exact same canon that is in Catholic Old Testaments today, and they didn't even uh, agree on each other. And it shows you kind of the how much authority these councils actually really played at the end of the day. Like yeah, a, and they were local. They were lo they were local councils. They weren't universal councils. So even if they were identical, which they weren't, but even if they were identical, all it would um, all it would show is what these local councils themselves embraced, not what the whole church embraced. Because we have to remember the Eastern churches um, were still united with the Western churches at that time, and it, it's not like it is today after the Great Schism in the in the eleventh century where they went off and had, had different canons. Um, there was question about the canon even back then, and we have to remember that the Bishop of Rome had a large jurisdiction, but it only went so far. It went to Gaul, Italy, of course, and to these North African councils, but the Bishop of Rome had no authority over the rest of, of the Roman Empire, you know, the, those Eastern churches. In fact, if you read Eusebius's church history, there were four specific sees that had had jurisdiction or authority. Rome was one, Antioch was another, um, Jerusalem was another, and Con Constantinople was the fourth one. But when you read all ten books of Eusebius's church history, there's no indication at all um, that the Bishop of Rome had any sort of um, real authority. As a matter of fact, the only um, uh, what was I going to say? The, the only Bishop that he ever refers to as Pope, I think, is the um, either the Bishop of Alexandria or the Bishop of Constantinople. He never actually refers to the Bishop of Rome as Pope even once. Yeah, I think even one of the Nicene councils limits the domain of the Pope. Oh, the, yeah. the Roman uh, Roman Bishop keeps saying Pope right. because it's a habit. They've 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 gotten to be a little bit to, to train to say that weird, but it's not technically historical. No, and I think. Yeah, and I think it's a council of Constantinople. It might be Nicaea, but it's in the fourth century where they said that the the bishop of Constantinople had the same basic authority that the bishop of uh, Rome actually had. The bishop of Rome did not have any uh, any authority, and there was a fourth century forgery um, that was supposedly written by Constantine to the bishop of Rome. But it turns out that that was just you know saying that the bishop of Rome had authority. It's now recognized as a for forgery. Yeah, I, I think uh, usually what they would have is like the Roman uh, bishop would only uh, maybe give helpful input or help decide issues when other churches appealed to him. Yeah. I think it would operate something like that. Because you, you just think about like, um, uh, what was his name? Cyril of um, Carthage, right? With the, yeah. There, there is no uh, bishop of bishops, you know, this, that, that, that local council, which I, you know, yeah, I think, no one affirms I, I think it was, yeah, I think it was, it was I think it was Saint Cyprian or something that said that, wasn't it? Oh yeah, Cyprian of Carthage. Yeah, I say Cyprian. Yeah, yeah, it's not Cyril. It's, it's Cyprian. And Cyprian, yeah. And um, of course, you know that local council doesn't count, but uh, it surely is good evidence that you know this this papacy thing is a little uh, some fishy there. I'll just put it that way. Yeah, and you can see where these topics where you're talking about the papacy or you're talking about the authority of the church and, and, and uh, the development and formation of the canon, you can see where a lot of this stuff really overlaps, and, and this can actually be a very big topic, and you can go on for hours, days talking about it, but it really gets down to a matter of sola ecclesia versus uh, sola scriptura, and, and sola ecclesia is basically has a subjective claim that the church has the authority to define not only what scripture is, but how to interpret it, even though Trent Horn admitted that the Catholic Church has only supposedly infa at most in infallibly inter interpreted seven verses, which I found was very low, because if they claim to go back to the first century, it took them 2,000 years, and they can only infallibly interpret seven verses out of the whole Bible, you know, and... Um, do we have versus it? versus sola scriptura and the sola scriptura doesn't mean that everything that you have to that you believe must come out of the Bible like you know who wrote the four books of or the four gospels but what it means it's the only um, infallible revelation from God to the church as far as Christian doctrine and morals it has nothing to do with the formation of the canon itself like I said we can glean from the New Testament um, who possessed the 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 uh, the true canon that Jesus embraced um 
but we can go outside of Scripture to know what books those were, and we would not be violating Sola Scriptura. Now, on the Council of Carthage, Albright challenged, uh, well, he asked you if, he, if you had read any of the primary resources, and you wisely said, that, well, we don't have the original stuff, so right. there, there is nothing to appeal to. They said the earliest references. Did he ever show yeah. that the early references included the book of Revelation, or did he just... No, as a, yeah, he, he, well, what happened is that he kind of danced around and didn't... Because I, I meant mentioned that the list that we have from the Council of Carthage um, is was was written after, and this is from uh, this is from um, Charles um, Joseph Charles von Hefley, which is which was a Catholic theologian. He says that the list that we have in Carthage actually comes after sometime after 418, um, which is why Revelation is found in in in, um, in the Council of Carthage uh, in 419. And what they did is that they retroactively placed it back into the Council of of, of Hippo, and they says that and and what he said is that they most likely got this from the previous council of, of, of hip. Oh, I'm sorry. It was retroactively placed back into the council of Carthage of, of 397, and where um, this collection of books came from, that was retroactively put back in, came from the previous council of Hippo, which included Revelation, but it may have also included, um, you know, or come from other councils. And if it would have come from the council of Laodicea. Um, Laodicea did not include the book of Revelation so it's sort of like we're, we're basing what's in the council of Carthage of 397 from later lists that were compiled from known and unknown sources you know so it's almost like they says okay we'll take a look at all these books and we're going to include the book of Revelation and retroactively put back in there, there's no way of actually proving it because you're using a later source in the 5th century Right, and, and this seems to build on the last question I asked, where, you know, look at, at sort of like if this council was thought to have decided the can any of these local councils, then look at like how strange this convoluted process is to figure out what the, one of them said, and you, you're like, oh, this is affirmed at a, 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 a at a at an infallible council, yet we don't even have mm -hmm. that list, yeah. and it's, to me, it's clear that even this isn't the Catholic view of these councils. At, at least no. Yeah. No, well, it's funny because when you do actually bring up some of these problems and that they're not identical to Trent later on, they'll say, well, these were just local councils. And it's like, this is what we've been telling you. You know, it's like you've, you've only conceded this, you know, fact and this lack of authority because you're finding the holes, you know, in your argumentation because they're trying to say Rome, Hippo, and Carthage had the exact same canon that, that are in Catholic Old Testaments today that were later affirmed at Trent. No, they didn't. You know, they were basing it on a later version of, of Jerome's Vulgate, which his version did not include Baruch, you know, and I think Third Ezra's was, you know, part of an appendage or something like that as well. But, um, yeah, but I mean, and if that's the case, if it was settled in the fourth century, then why do you find even popes and cardinals, you know, throughout church history rejecting these books? Pope Gregory the Great said that these books were were edifying for reading, but they were not part of the canon. When you get into the latter Middle Ages, the Glossa Ordinaria, which was sort of like a like a, a Bible commentary or, or study Bible for Catholic theologians in the, in the latter Middle Ages, they said that all the books of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament are part of the canon, but every one of the Apocrypha, including the Greek editions to Esther and Daniel, each one of them they say, this is not in the canon, this is not in the canon, this is not in the canon. And even Cardinal Cajetan, who is no friend of Luther, he was very antagonistic against them, um, agreed with Luther that these books don't believe in the canon, so did uh, Cardinal Zemenis, which called them Apocrypha, and even Erasmus, who produced a fresh Greek copy of the New Testament, did not agree this was part of, uh, of the Bible. You know, so, and these are people who did not join the Reformation. Right, so for, from this period all the way back to those councils themselves, nobody actually had that interpretation of them, that they were deciding the canons and that uh, they were authoritative for you know the future onward. Yeah, and like I tell, uh, told you know Trenton, and I told Gary and others, I, I said, I'd be happy if you gave me just one source of anyone, early Jews from antiquity or any early church father in the first few centuries, who enumerated every single book that are in Catholic Old Testaments today. You don't have to give me a bunch. I I, I settle for just one. 
because I could give you numerous early church fathers and Jews who only believed in, in the books of the Hebrew Bible. I, I, I'd be happy if you gave me one that's identical to the Catholic Old Testament, and they can't. Oh, see, this is, so, uh, yeah, this is just, it's just, this is what Catholicism is to me. It's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, a bunch of historical claims, posturing, and then when it comes to the actual details, it's like, oh, you know, that's just local council. and Like, even even when you mentioned, uh, like, Rome, right? Rome, mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned uh, three church fathers that went to Rome. Each of them, uh, at least, wait, uh, I know Jerome and, uh, what's his name, starts with E? Epiphanius. Epiphanius. Yeah, they held to the, uh, like you said, the limited Old Testament canon, right? Right, they did. And one of the things that they'll bring up with some of these church fathers, they'll say, well, they considered these books to be scripture, and they even used it scripture. Well, one thing we have to understand is in the early church, um, they used terms sometimes differently than, than we, we do today. For instance, the, some of them would actually use the word scripture to refer to books that are not inspired scripture. Again, look at um, Irenaeus with, with, with um, the shepherd of Hermas. Look at um, the epistle of Jeremiah with First Enoch. He calls them scripture. So sometimes scripture would be used to describe an uninspired writing, because that's what scripture means. It comes from the Greek, which means writing. Um, but they didn't necessarily say that it was canonical. And this is why we have to focus on what they consider to be canonical. And again, even Augustine made a distinction between the canonical Hebrew Bible and the um, ecclesiastical books, which were the part of the Deuterocanon. Now, he considered them part of the Old Testament, but that was because of his ignorance of, of Jewish history. But Jerome made a, made a distinction between the two. He goes, the church does not recognize these as, as being part of, of the Old Testament. And uh, I just... And Athanasius also, didn't he affirm pretty much nearly the Protestant canon except for, like, Esther? Yeah, he, he didn't include Esther, and there could be reasons for that, like as he might have been familiar, because he, he was familiar with the Jews' canon, and he may have been familiar about the sensitivity that uh, the Essenes in particular had about Esther, um, and he included Baruch, but again, you're talking mid to late 4th century, so, and he was, a, he was an early church father and a doctor in the church, by the way, um, in the East, along with Cyril, who was another doctor of the church, um, and they both included Baruch because by that time, Baruch was recognized as being part of Jeremiah because they belie believed that that was written by Baruch, but both Jeremiah and Baruch had been dead for like seven or eight centuries by the time that um, that apocryphal book of Baruch was written. Same with the epistle of Jeremiah. And I, I'm glad in your conversation with them, you, you seem to have the same like confusion as I do when there's like these um, uh, anathemas that are not applied backwards in time. Like, yeah, that, that, go ahead. Yeah, go please. Because uh, you get the Catholics like, oh, this is the faith once and for all handed to the saints. It's given to you guys, mm -hmm. you guys. Uh, but you know, Protestants they come out in the 15th. So there's there was no John Huss, not a thing. No. Uh, Tyndale myth, not even real, probably a apocryphal legend. But uh -huh. <laughs> but if you say, <laughs> but if you say um, uh, any of these, uh, you cast any historical doubt on our claims. Well, uh, well, you know these, uh, uh, the, we have that faith, the deposit. It's always been there, except uh, when we talk about it actually applying in the present time. You see, we we don't retroactively apply the anathemas. That, it's okay to believe heresy as, as long as it's not defined, but these things are the faith. They are truly the faith. No one would have thought that before, but they really would have. It's yeah, and, and, and uh, James White flushed this out in his debate against Gary Machuda when he was talking about anathema, and he says, so another word, he says, would you say that uh, Cardinal Cajetan and Cardinal Zimenez, who lived be before the Council of Rome, were they anathema? And, and Gary Machuda said, well, no, because anathemas don't work in in reverse, and he says, so in other words, um, they would have, because the Council of Trent declared an anathema and anybody who rejected the apocryphal books. And he says, so in other words, he wasn't anathematized because um, he was born too soon. And he says, well, yeah, because they don't, um, anathemas don't work in reverse. And I'm thinking to myself, so when the Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians and he said, even if 
one of us, an apostle or an angel for, from heaven, declares a di different gospel, let him be anathema. So does that mean before he wrote this to the Church of Galatians that the Pharisees who were declaring a different gospel, they weren't anathema because they weren't preaching this before the apostle Paul wrote it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's to me, that's insane. That's like saying, yeah. we don't have the... No, it's like a... <laughs> it's. It's, it's like a Hegelian dialectic. No one really has the true faith till the end of time. And then yeah. we'll have the real Christianity. It'll just be fully developed by that time. And to me, that's yeah. just to say we never have it at any time, at any moment in between. And this really goes back to the bigger issue of, it's like, okay, it's great. We know what books belong in the Old Testament, but what's the bigger picture? And the bigger picture is that Jesus said that he would build a church and the gates of Hades would not prevail against it. And so he would not give his church... Uh, a canon that was incomplete, meaning missing books, inspired books that don't belong in them, but he also wouldn't give him a canon that includes uninspired books that don't belong in them. And when you read the Apostle Paul, he equates um, having um, a false gospel with believing in a false Christ. And we have to remember, Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, meaning the Old Testament, but I came to fulfill them. So, and that's is why this is so important, because the Old Testament tells us about who the promised Jewish Messiah is. And if you have books in there that are teaching a different gospel, that, you're, that, you're, that Jesus' death on the cross, the Messiah's atonement wasn't sufficient you know, for your salvation, but that you can cooperate you know, with um, what he did on the cross, like in Tobit when it talks about um, you know, uh, that uh, forgiving sins through alms-bearing, then you're saying that Jesus believed this because he was fulfilling those comments and those books that are in the Old Testament that teach this false gospel. So you're actually believing not only in a different Jesus, you're also believing in a different gospel because you're believing that Jesus is teaching this, this false form of salvation. This is why knowing what books belong in the Old Testament and being certain of it is so critical. You know, I, I think I could develop a good, like, just like you do. This is a powerful argument that I don't even think Catholics even spend, like, a the, the worth of time on that they really should. It's quite clear, necessarily, that the first century church preached a much more, let's say, limited gospel, even on the Catholic view, to take it for granted. It, it, don't you find it suspicious that the gospel grows over time instead of remaining the same? Like, wouldn't the expectation it be mm -hmm. identical to the first century gospel? Right, and why do you think that is? Why, why does the gospel tend to change as opposed to staying the same? Because as the Septuagint continued to grow after the first century, which even Gary Machuda admitted it was a liturgical text and continued to add books, it began to add books that added to the sufficiency of Christ's atonement. It started to add these books that talked about almsgiving and giving money and everything else, and um, they began to teach a different gospel. It didn't happen overnight. It, it happened slowly over time, but it did actually happen. And, and uh, fortunately, God worked through Luther and the Reformers to get the gospel back. Amen. That's it. Also, i got to say... Uh, thank you for coming on. I, I really enjoyed this. I don't know. I, I'm not the best host, but I really appreciate uh, uh, this this uh, conversation. I, oh, believe me, the pleasure is all mine, and I'm glad that you let me ramble on for as long as I can because this is an issue that I love talking about, and the reason I love talking about it is because it really hits home. And I tell people my conversion away from Catholicism wasn't because of anything bad that happened to me. I loved my Catholic upbringing. I love and love my, my Catholic family, most of which are still Catholic. But when I started studying the, the Bible, beginning with the New Testament, I started re realizing that a lot of the beliefs that, that are in Catholicism today come from these extra books, and I wanted to know for certain what books belong in the Old Testament. And when I realized that the boundaries of the Catholic Old Testament are still not 100% certain, I couldn't get from um, the from from the Catholic Church, so I had to go to the New Testament and, and read from the Apostle Paul and our our Lord Jesus Himself to find out what it was. And over time, I I learned that that Luther and the reformers are, are right. They didn't tear books out of the Bible. They realized these books were never in the Bible of Jesus to begin with.
So I'm going to, just to make sure you're okay with this, you still got more time? I got all the time in the world. Oh, good, because I, I, I got plenty of time as well, so I, I guess I, I'd like to ask you, because my friend who was supposed to co-host this, who obviously is a horrible person, decided not to show up. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't love God's Word, clearly, because that's what this is about. Uh, Absolutely. He, uh, he decided that his birthday is more important, and I bet his wife wouldn't let him come, but it's okay with me. So, oh, for heaven forbid his birthday. Oh, my goodness. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, hap well, happy birthday to your, your Bible-hating friend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jimmy, that's for you. So he, he, I, I got a question from him. He was So I, I love to ask you his question. Um, what does he think of extra-biblical visitations from God? Does it threaten the Protestant view of canonicity if there were examples of people saved without any knowledge of Scripture since these people would possess saving knowledge through other means. Okay, if they're ta if he's talking about like extra biblical revelation, we have to understand that's one of the ways that we know what was actually considered inspired scripture because when and we have to understand when you read the Old Testament, even though at the surface it looks like that miracles and and revelations from God were having happening all the time, it was very sparse. The, um, the main p periods of time when this was happening was during the time of Moses and Joshua and during the time of Elijah and Elisha and, of course, you know, towards the end, you know, um, during the time of the, the prophets, because Elijah and Elisha, you could argue, introduced the prophetic area. And then there was an explosion during the time of, of Jesus and the apostles in the first century. And not only were these miracles being done to validate what they said, but it was also done to validate what they wrote actually came from God and not themselves. I can write a book and claim that it came from God. It's another thing if I prove it by raising someone from the dead or curing blindness from birth, you know. And th this is how we, and, and it only happened during the time that written revelation was taking place. The other, pr the problem with believing in, um, extra biblical revelation outside of the these time periods um, is the fact that you if you say that something that you're, it, you're something that you're experiencing is coming from God you potentially still have the canon could be open because if I could say I got a, a prophecy from God and you know then I could say well the New Testament isn't closed yet I'm gonna write the gospel according to Steve you know, and, and add it to the New Testament. But so we have to have some type of means that we know of that was um, was completed. And as you mentioned earlier, Jude writes about the faith that was, that was once for all handed down to the saints. And we know that the the apostles and New Testament prophets were the foundation of the church, and more prophets weren't built on top of prophets. The, the apostles and the prophets were just the foundation and the church would be built you know on top of them um, so I, I I would I would be what you would call a cessationist which is not a very popular um, um, viewpoint in, in Christendom at the same time I would not say that someone who is a continuationist I would not entertain the idea of them not being a brother in Christ there are many reformed, brothers in Christ who believe the exact same thing that I do, but they don't necessarily believe there's anything in the New Testament that says, here's a verse that says you know, that you know such and such um, ceases. Uh, but when they begin to say that your salvation is based on you know believing this, then I, th then I have some concern. Right. And to me, this really doesn't challenge Sola Scriptura so much. Like, oh, well, right. uh, God spoke to Enoch way back then. We don't have uh, so much all the contents of those conversations, or even with Abraham, even the biblical examples that have been provided. But to, to me, what we have are publicly accessible revelations in the scriptures. And they, right. insofar as you know, God doesn't actually come talk to you, are the standard even for others, unless they have that experience as well. Uh, mm -hmm. so like, yeah, if we lived in in Israel and the time, whether maybe we're carrying around, you know, so things happened back then, and it was a lot more common back then. Um, yeah. So, and a lot of that had to, had to do with the fact that Revelation hadn't been written yet, too. So there was a lot more intervention from God, whether he talked with 
Adam or, he, or, or Noah walked you know, with God, Enoch walked with God, and, and then God took him. Even Moses during this time period, um, there was no written revelation to compare experiences to, you know. So, uh, and then and then God validated by the miracles, you know, that they had performed, like parting the Red Sea or or whatever. And um, but that, but then when you get to a certain period of time, like it says, when Scripture is completed, meaning all of the canon, um, you know that revelation. It's not that that revelation of God in oral form or you know whatever it's not it's not necessary anymore because because scripture is sufficient to tell us what comes from God and what doesn't he doesn't need to add any additional revelation and this is another reason why we know the apocrypha is not scripture because there was a 400 year period or about that where there was no revelation from God there were no prophets during this time period first and second Maccabees, Maccabees makes it clear that um, there were no prophets um, during the time of the Maccabees. They were they were gone. I mean, the, and and it even says that they were when the stones of the temple were um, tossed and destroyed. That you know they moved to a mountain until a prophet would come one day to um, tell them what to do. And when that shows not only that there weren't prophets during this time, but if there were prophets, we have to remember the books of the Maccabees were written like around 100 BC, and the time period they're talking about is about 164 or so BC. So dur during this 50, 60 year period, um, if there were prophets around during this time, the later writer of the Maccabees certainly would have said, okay, the prophet came and told them what to do with these stones, but he doesn't because there were no prophets around. Right, and to me, like if a guy comes out of a jungle, tells you, you know, he has a revelation, you know, in terms of like a private revelation that, that uh, Jesus is the Messiah and it's like something like that. You, you hand the guy a Bible and tell him, you know, this is <laughs> this is uh, publicly accessible revelation. And it, I, say that happens, right? Say say God did reveal this message of, of uh, salvation to a guy. It, it seems to me like that doesn't mean that scripture is now irrelevant to that person. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's just it doesn't it wouldn't get it doesn't get you what you need. All it would say is like this guy thinks Jesus is Messiah based on this experience he had. That's, right. that's fine and dandy, but that doesn't mean the scripture's not sufficient. So to me, it would be a non sequitur. It, yeah, exactly. And you know, you also have to be careful because a lot of uh, so-called prophets they might predict something that comes true and they could just get lucky. And <laughs> in there are other situations when you really examine some of these so-called prophets. There's a lot they get wrong, and as Moses warns us in Deuteronomy 18, that if you, if a, a so-called prophet, you know, tells you about something and it doesn't happen, um, then you should not be afraid of him. I mean, as a matter of fact, that particular so-called false prophet would have been killed. And um, and they says even if what they sue does say does come true and like they get lucky or whatever, if they're drawing you away from the gospel, they're drawing you away from the true God. You know that that successful um, fulfilled prophecy did not come from God because God isn't going to tell you to go follow uh, Baal or, or, or some other false god. Completely agree. Um, so an, an, a, a weird question. So you have a chapter in your book on the Dewey Rames. Yeah. And you know, I, I, am, a, I am purely a Sixtus Vulgate originalist. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't hold any of these modern novelties. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, so that that's for those who who are listening that don't get it. Uh, basically, the Sixtus was a, a Sixtus six. Um, there was a famous Vulgate produced by a, by Pope Sixtus, uh, whatever the number I forget, and it was supposedly infallible. But it was so bad and written with mistakes, they 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 tossed it out for the Clementine uh, yeah. Sixtus Vulgate. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite examples. But uh, so for the Dewey Rhyme, so an actual question for it. Um, do, how authoritative is that for a Roman Catholic? <laughs> well, they, they, it's kind of funny because they, it came out one year before the King James, the original King James Bible came out in, in 1611. And one thing we have to understand is that the Dewey Rhymes. Um, they basically say, well, if you're going to, you want to read a, 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 the accurate English translation, uh, you know, of the the Bible in English, you, you go back to the Dewey Rings, you know, because that's 
you know, that, that's going to tell you what the original said. The problem is, is that the Dewey Reams was not based on the, um, the Hebrew of the Old Testament and the Greek of the New Testament. It was actually a translation um, from the Vulgate, I believe. And, or at least, you know, that's, at least that's what I was told, you know, growing up. Now, some of the uh, new, new modern translations that's based on the Dewey Reams do, te- you know, tend to go back to the, um, the Hebrew and Greek, like the New Catholic version of the Bible actually specifies that. And that's the reason why um, the translations, bet- the modern translations read differently than, than the Dewey Reams. But the other thing, too, is that Dewey Reams leaves some um, verses and even like, like half chapters out of the book of Jeremiah that were originally supposedly in Septuagint. And we know this is because in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul draws from these verses and these chapters as authoritative scripture that was fulfilled in the, in the, in the person of Jesus Christ. But they're not found in the Douay Reims. And the common belief is that um, the Old Testament was transferred from, uh, translated from Hebrew and Aramaic into the Greek Septuagint, which includes the Apocrypha, and then it was translated into Jerome's Vulgate, and then it, then Jerome's Vulgate was translated into the Dewey Reims, and then modern translations are based on it. And there's a ton of problems with that, you know, beginning with the Septuagint and what books were in it, and, and uh, what Jerome actually translated from, because he didn't translate directly from the Septuagint, and then the Douay Reims is a translation of the later version of, of Jerome's Vulgate. It was not translated from the original because the original didn't include Baruch, you know, and the later version included Baruch, you know, and then like the whole issue with the, those extra, those missing verses, you know, from the Septuagint, you know, so it's only authoritative as far as Rome says that it is. But if you, if you really dig into the history, um, the Douay Reims is just a, an an uninspired translation. I tell people that even the Septuagint isn't, you know, considered isn't really inspired because it's a translation, just like our English translations, you know, aren't um, inspired in in the sense that they're completely free of error in terms of translation. You know, because some versions use different words. You know, because some are more word for word as opposed to word for thought. But again, like I said, look at the apostles. They deviated from the Septuagint. You know, Matthew deviated from Hosea, and, and um, John deviated from Zechariah. So I ran into a group of Catholics. Of course, this is the internet, so you can run into anything. But this group of yes. Catholics had maintained that the Dewey Reims was an infallible uh, translation. And oh, they're they're they're, they're Douay Reims only. <laughs> yes, they were they were, and I was just so shocked. I was shocked. I didn't know how to. I've never heard anyone present such a thing to me. I'm like, well, if that's your authority. I, I won't fight you on it. It's just, I was not really impressed. Yeah, I mean, it's just uh, because yeah, because because I actually have a new Catholic version of the Bible, and there's a forward to it, and it says that the Douay Bible is a very faithful translation of the Vulgate by English exiles at the Seminary of Douay, who, who published the New Testament at Reims in 1582 and the Old Testament at Douay at 1609 and 1610. So it's a translation of the Vulgate, but then a question you have to ask yourself, which Vulgate? You know, it was the Vulgate um, that they had access to um, in the 16th century. It was, it was not the Vulgate that they from the time of Jerome, so there's there's a, there's a lot of problems, you know, with translation there. So and you know, and I don't even think that's the view of the magisterium of the Catholic Church that you go strictly by the Douay Reims, because if you did, there's a lot of um, heretical translations. Like for instance, I mentioned in my book, the New American Bible does this really weird thing with the additions to Esther, because if you look at the Douay Reims or you look at a New Catholic version of the Bible. The first 10 chapters of Esther are just like in ours, you know, as far as order. But then, and then they add the additions to Esther at the very end, chapters 11 on. But the New American Bible does this weird thing where it places chapter letters in between the chapter numbers of the book of Esther. The chapter numbers being the Hebrew and Aramaic and the chapter letters being the Greek editions. You know, and it's really hard to follow and compare to other Catholic versions, including the Douay Reims. Wow. Okay. So, 
I was glad because I see it in. It's like you're the only book I, I read that would have, it really got addressed the topic of the Dewey Rings very well. It's not often other Protestant Catholic writings that, that it's brought up. So I really appreciate that, especially for my discussion with these strange group of uh, Dewey Rings onlyists. Yeah, well, the funny part was is that I thought my book was actually going to be a small booklet, like under a hundred pages, maybe eighty. Because I'm like, I read the, I wrote the first couple chapters. I'm like, okay, I'm done. But then I was thinking, well, you know, what if they bring this up? What if they bring up the Vulgate? What if they bring up the Reims? What if they bring up the Eastern Orthodox Bible? And it just grew and grew and grew, and a, and an eighty-page book turned into two hundred and seventy. <laughs> we can't wait for the second edition. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of funny. My mother made the comment, you know, because I really hadn't set out to write either book. They just, honestly, I really believe it, I was led by God to do this because if I was planning on doing it myself, I wouldn't have known even how to start. But I could just see the Holy Spirit guiding me, not in an infallible way. I want to make that perfectly clear. clear but he, he guided me to, you know, to be doing his will. Um, and my mother made the comment. She goes, it's not a matter of if you're going to write another book. It's a matter of when. And I just kind of <laughs> chuckled at that. Nice, nice. Uh, no, that's amazing. Oh, I appreciate it. You're a good writer. And, man, you're a good speaker. I really appreciate it. You're, you're holding the conversation up on our end. Yeah, well, like I says, I appreciate you letting me babble on for so long because I do realize I tend to do that. But it's just when you love talking about something, especially something that comes from God, it's – I, I don't look at the Bible as being God. It's the, it's the Word of God, which is a, a huge difference that needs to really be emphasized here. But what I know about God is through His Word, and every time I pick it up, I learn something new about Him, even if it's a verse I've re read a hundred times. And it just draws me closer to Him. That's something that I couldn't do when I was you know, raised up in Catholic Church. And like I, I want to emphasize... I love being Catholic. I love the rituals. I'm, I'm actually a very ritualistic person. Um, maybe OCD might be a better <laughs> terminology. Um, but my mom says, well, at least this is something good that you're doing, <laughs> you know, that's, that you're obsessed with. But it's just I am. I'm, I'm obsessed in a good way with God. And because I can't have a physical conversation with him like you and I are having right now, this is the next best thing. And, and I just draw closer and more intimate with him by reading his word, and I'm so glad that I know what his word is and what it isn't. Exactly, and especially the written word where, you know, even Jesus compares, uh, you know, from what they would have read, it's as if hearing the very word, you know, God speaking to you. I believe uh, uh, James White uses that in his debates, and I think that's just mm -hmm. so true. Um, yeah, and I, tell you, I learned a lot, honestly, from James White early on. I, the funny part was um, I first learned about him on Facebook when we were talking about different translations of the Bible and someone had made the comment about um, the King James Version and using the word mansion in, in, in John 14, I think it is, instead of rooms. And, and then someone turned me on to his, um, his comment, you know, or com series of comments that he ma made against Sam Gipp, you know, who made a video about the KGB only. And, and I don't want to make this about KGB because I use the KGB too. Um, but... Um, it led me into other things of realizing, oh, he has videos on Catholicism. I want to, I want to learn about this. And I learned, I read about some of his stuff. I learned about his debate with Gary while I was writing my book. I didn't, I didn't know about the debate prior to that. And um, it, it, a lot of his information specifically about the canon and, and Catholicism has just been invaluable to me. And I, as you know, I, I cited him a few t uh, times even in my book. Yeah, especially as, a, or at least you mentioned his debate with him and Machuda. I do. I, I, it, it's an Appendix B at the towards the very beginning. I mention about it, and you know about about, and I and I quote the debate. And I think I'm one other place somewhere in the book. I think I, I mention it, but but I do um, I, I do quote him from the debate uh, as well as um, outside of the debate things that he said. Yeah, and he's basically been the pretty much the only, I don't want to say only, but he's kind of been the only Protestant debater for uh, uh, debating Roman Catholics for all these years. So, mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, I, I thought your debates uh, were on par with his. I thought yeah, maybe even better, I thought, yeah, to be honest. Oh, thank you. Well, because like, I drew a lot of stuff from the thing he said, but at the same time, I didn't want to um, be a um, 
uh, uh, James White light, you know, All and right. I, I wanted to introduce some fresh topics and fresh uh, perspectives. And that's why I went the direction of um, Luke chapter 16 and what books the Pharisees, you know, embrace because Jesus embraced the Pharisees. And, and if you notice at the beginning of my book, I actually gave credit to Jimmy Aiken from Catholic Answers, that he's the one that convinced me that the Protestant Old Testament was the true Old Testament. And I think that's one of the reasons why Trent wanted to debate me, because not only did I quote Trent Horn in my book, um, someone let on to him on YouTube that he goes, you need to read this book. And he saw that I used Catholic answers as a source for the Protestant Old Testament. So I'm sure he wanted to discuss it with me to, to do some damage control, right. as did Gary Machuda, because in terms of the Old Testament canon on the Catholic side, Gary is probably the, the top one right now, you know, and I found out from a friend of his, uh, John Martinoni, that from EWTN, that um, he wanted to debate me. And I'm like, okay, I says, I, I'll, I'm the underdog here, so I got nothing to lose, you know. So I was very encouraged by you and, and encouraged to, by my other friend, um, Jeff, who reached out to me about a month ago, who told me that after listening to both of my debates against Gary and Trent that he's convinced that the Catholic position on the Old Testament canon is wrong and like you he said he felt that I did well against both of them both my debates so I was very encouraged by that so I thank you and I, and I thank my other friend um, Jeff as well oh no problem it's it, uh, the pleasure's all mine uh, I got you to come on my show and talk about the issue it's, uh, it's awesome because I love this issue as well um, and mainly because my uh, one, you know, you know, you want to have good reasons for what's in your Bible. That's namely one. Number two is, you know, mm -hmm. it has the uh, apologetic a aspect to it, which uh, a lot of cults, you know, different books, especially, uh, you know, the, the famous. Uh, well, you know, I have a background in Roman Catholicism, so having mm -hmm. that uh, solidifies my faith as well. It gives me a, a personal little help and also helps me help others and that's what I'm glad about your book that's why I'm going to say everyone should go buy your book it's definitely the best treatment on the subject that I, I for a product you know lay Protestant like myself right and that's another thing too is that I didn't want it to be at the scholarly level of a McDonald or a Roger Beckwith because you know those books are very good by the way I, I mean especially Beckwith's book I mean Beckwith's book is invaluable but it's written at a scholarly level and I wanted to write a book that the average lay Protestant or Catholic or anybody else would be able to understand. It's still scholarly, but at a, you know, I would say probably if you, if you graduated from high school, you should be able to understand this book. I didn't want to write it at a level that it was above people's heads, you know. So, that, so that's why that I wrote it the way that I did. And I didn't want it to be a 500-page book. It's under 300 pages. It's 270 pages, and it's basically got every argument that I could possibly think of as a former Catholic that somebody would bring up. You know, is it completely free from error? No, because it's not scripture. You know, but at the same time, after reading it, I think you could be confident that the that the Bible that Jesus and the apostles embraced was the same exact same books that are in our Protestant Old Testaments today. So I, I want to ask you now about like a common misconception amongst I want to say Protestants is uh, the quote unquote Council, end quote, uh, of, of Jamnia. <clears throat> yeah. It's not a thing. Well, it's not, it wasn't a council, at least. Can you uh, explain that to us, our simple minded Protestant friends? Sure. I'm glad we're actually getting into this. Um, the quote unquote Council of Jamnia wasn't actually a council. What it was is a rabbinic school where they discussed a, a slew of different things, not just the canon. And it, they didn't. They, they weren't deciding what books went into the canon. What they were doing is that it was a group, group of rabbinic Jews in Jamnia who were discussing books that were already in their canon. And one of those books, you know, that they that some rabbis were concerned about was the book of Ecclesiastes. And the um, and the rabbinic Jews were the ancestors of of the Pharisees. And there are two predominant schools of Pharisees, the, the, the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai. The school of Hillel embraced the exact same books that are, are in Protestant Old Testaments today, including Song of Solomon, 
Ecclesiastes, Esther, it was exactly the same. In fact, even Gary Machuda and Trent Horn concedes this point. They actually said this on our post-debate interview. So I'm like, great, thanks for backing me up. And um, this Sh- Shammai, the school, Pharisaic school of Shammai was a little more hesitant on Ecclesiastes and maybe Song of Solomon because like Esther, Song of Solomon doesn't really directly mention God. But it was still in their canon. And that's why I brought up in my book that um, having... Um, difficulties in these books doesn't mean that they outright rejected them. And at Jamnia, that's all that they were doing. You know, th- these books were in their canon, um, but they were discussing certain books that maybe some other Jews or Jews of the past might have had issues with, whether or not they made the hands unclean, and what that is, it's a term to describe whether or not a book is considered from Scripture because. Um, the, 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 they looked at the Bible as being so holy and coming from God because you're not, if you touch the scriptures, then you would have, the Jews would have to go wash their hands because they're, they're putting their unclean hands on a, uh, on, a, um, on, an, on a clean Bible and it would make their hands unclean. But nonetheless, I mean, these are, we know these are the same books that, um, that the Jews of antiquity um, embraced because the Pharisees in particular embraced these Books and again, the Apostle Paul was from this Pharisaic school of Hillel, and Hillel had the same books that are in Protestant Old Testaments today. So that's all Jamnia did. So I would like to, you know, for you know, pretend to be a Catholic and ask you this question. Um, so Protestants often say they hold to traditions, right? They don't get rid of themselves so scripture. It's not the denial that there are valid traditions, but rather that they are subjugated under the authority of scripture. They're, they're, they're not infallible. They did not come to the level of, of the scriptures themselves. Now, uh, so one thing they cite as evidence is 2 Timothy 3. Mm-hmm. Um, they say this is an example, you know, when, when uh, well, when Moses confronts Pharaoh's magicians, you know, the names clearly aren't in the Old Testament, nor to be found, but, but rather, look, it's preserved in some Jewish tradition. So it kind of mm-hmm. maybe gives credit, or give a, not credit, but gives evidence of, look, they, there was this view of infallible tradition just floating around. This really sounds like the mystical, you know, Roman Catholic traditions that only pop out, you know, 1,800 years later. So uh, what do you think about someone presenting that as, like, evidence that maybe we should take these as a valid means of knowledge and therefore the Catholic's authority is validated by kind of like a floating right. tradition? Sure. You know, and this is an example of a Catholic straw man argument where they're setting a, a, something up, up to tear down that, that it's not what Protestants mean by sola scriptura. Again, sola scriptura simply means that in terms of Christian doctrine and, and, and morals, that the scriptures alone and not the church um, is the sole revelation from God. So when you hear about different traditions or things in the New Testament that you don't find in the Old Testament, all they're discussing are things that happened during the Old Testament era that are being written in the New Testament. It's no different than when the when Jude directly quotes First Enoch and calls it prophecy. He's not saying it's inspired scripture. He's talking about a prophecy um, that was later recorded in an uninspired book, and then Jude is simply recording it. Or when uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, quotes from pagan sources like Epimenides, you know, and and records it, the history of it in, in the New Testament. He, they're not using phrases like the scriptures say or um, or uh, it is written or anything like that. I mean, they're simply recording things that happen, and that does not violate um, sola scriptura. If And that's why it's really important to for Catholics and even Protestants to understand what sola scriptura is and what sola scriptura is not. Yeah, so when like they present this same thing to me, I'll say something like, you know, say there it was a tradition just floating around in the the uh, intertestamental period, right? Mm-hmm. Um, who said that uh, intertestamental per- uh, traditions can't be true? Exactly, and- they can be they can be historically true, you know, exactly. And it's just if it's a matter of whether or not these traditions are considered to be 
um, God breathed and written down in scripture. One of the, 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 the ones that can't, that even Trent brought up was like, well, what about the apostle Paul when he talks about the traditions that were given by Paul to the Corinthians or the Thessalonians or whatever. And it was, um, that's communicated either by letter or by word. Well, what he's saying is that, that the same traditions that he, they're teach he's teaching about Christ that affect doctrine are communicated either by written word or by oral word, but it's the same traditions. It's not some traditions by uh, oral and some traditions by written. It's it's the same traditions. Exactly. Uh, like, like they're confusing means with utterly different things, and and they even think like, uh, oh yeah, I think it's like Second uh, Thessalonians, like two fifteen or something. And they're like, oh, yeah, let's just stick all the Marian dogmas in that slight word and hope that it pays yeah. out at the end of the time. I just, it's, yeah. it's, to me, most of this is a, a papal wish, wishful thinking. Yeah, exactly. And another thing, too, is if you take a look, I did a word search in a Bible study a while back, and I looked up the word tradition or traditions in the Bible. And out of the 14 times that it appears, mostly in the New Testament, 11 out of the 14 times, it's traditions that are viewed negatively, like in Mark chapter 7 when he talks about the traditions of men, when he's, he's rebuking the Pharisees. The three times that the Apostle Paul mentions traditions in a positive light in, in, in his letters to the Thessalonians and the Corinthians, it's referring to tra traditions that were also written down or previously written down that specifically affect doctrine. But um, my, again, my friend Jeff from Agoy for Jesus, you know, he you know, has a great video on YouTube about um, on Mark chapter 7, you know, and what, what was happening there, unlike Matthew's um, version of it, uh, Mark talks about Korban. And what Korban was, was that the Jews had believed that these oral traditions that are not found in the Old Testament that affect doctrine um, were passed along orally from Moses to the elders down to the time of, of the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders, and they put these extra-biblical traditions that affect doctrine um, at the same level of Scripture. And what was happening is that they were conflicting with the Word of God, and that's why I said you, you embrace Korban, and by doing so you negate the Word of God for the sake of your traditions. In other words, he did not consider this oral tradition at the same level of Scripture, not just because it contradicted it, but because um, true revelation from God is not going to contradict um, other revelation from God. Yeah, and this is exactly, so to go back to the, the example I gave with uh, those confronting Moses, like, uh, it, it, it shows you that this was never thought of, this oral traditions or traditions floating around, you, you know, in those time periods were never thought of as these merely infallible mechanisms for pooping out ideas. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's just assumed. And like, uh, you're, you're going to debate that one, uh, one Roman Catholic on the papacy, he basically kind of argues that the Sanhedrin was infallible. Yeah. Then, well, then you get into another problem. Well, if the Sanhedrin was infallible, what were they saying? They were saying, do not follow Jesus. Do not you know, accept him as your promised Old Testament Messiah. So if they're infallible in the same way that the, that the magisterium of the Catholic Church and the, and the papacy is, then... Do we should we then reject um, Jesus as our Messiah? In which in which case we should reject the papacy and the magisterium too, because they claim Jesus is our Messiah. Yep, I already got my yarmulke. We're going all the way back. So because uh, you'd be have to be a Jew. Um, mm -hmm. My um oh yeah, my next question is going to be about um. You know, what about the letters? Didn't Paul write letters we don't have? So it seems like we're already missing some scripture. Um, right. What's your thoughts about that? Right, and I cover this in my book as well. And we have to understand that there is there are two letters to the Corinthians that the Apostle Paul wrote. And, uh, and if we, you read the New Testament, there's one, maybe two other letters that he wrote. So, we're like, so the question is, are these considered lost books? Are these inspired books that he wrote? What we have to remember is just because somebody, including Apostle, writes something, that doesn't mean that everything that he wrote was Scripture. I mean, if he wrote a letter um, to his sister, because Paul had a sister, if you read the book Acts or, or Romans, 
Um, does that mean that what the letter that he wrote to his sister is inspired? No, because the letter specifically has to do with doctrine that affects the whole church, even if he's writing to a specific church. Like when he's writing to the church of Corinth, it's directly to the church of Corinth, but it is meant for um, the church as a whole throughout history. So if, so the first letter that he would have written before 1 Corinthians, that would not have been considered inspired scripture that was meant for the whole church. It may have simply just been a letter that we um, th that he wrote specifically for that church. And we don't even know what it is. It's lost to history. And if it's lost to history, then we know it's not inspired because God would not have um, allowed an inspired writing to be lost. I mean, because God is the one that gave us the, the scriptures, not the church. And and he is sovereign over everything, including what books go in his, his Bible. And then as far as the other book that was written, it, it's it's referred to the book uh, to the Laodiceans because when he sends, um, um, what's his name? No, from Philemon, the, the um. omnificence or whatever his name is. I, I, it's leaving me right now. Um, and he sends sends him back. Um, he says you should read this book uh, from the Laodiceans, and the Laodiceans should read your book. Now, some people have thought that the book of the Laodiceans is actually the book of the Ephesians, because in the earliest copies of the book of Ephesians we have, where it begins uh, to the church of Ephesus, it's actually not there. It's actually believed that the book of Ephesus was more of a universal church, not meant strictly for that church, but for churches in that area, you know, and eventually right. for the church as a whole. Yeah, they so that may around or something like that. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they were. They were. They were circled around. Anesimus. That's what I'm thinking of. Anesimus. You know, from the Book of Philemon. And um, so that book may not have been a separate book, the Book of the, to the Laodiceans, but rather the the Epistle to the Ephesians, which was, as you said, a, a book that circled around the the, the Christian churches. What would be a good bibliography for, for uh, books on the canon? What would you recommend people read? Oh, my. Well, besides mine, because like, <laughs> mine's, really, mine's really short, um, as far as the Old Testament canon, if you want some real meat, uh, Roger Beckwith's book, The Old Testament Canon of the New Testament Church. It's an older book. It was written about 50 years ago. And as far as I know, I think Roger Beckwith is still alive. He's in his 90s. Um, but um, it's not an easy read, but if you read it, I don't know how you can come out of it not knowing what the canon is. Um, I like Ro Ro um, uh, Lee Mark McDonald's The Biblical Canon. Uh, the downside, he never actually tells you what the canon is, but there are some real nuggets and, and important seeds that are in there that I drew from, like um, Hillel having the same type, the same books that are in Protestant Old Testaments today, and that and that the Apostle Paul and Gamaliel were from the school of Hillel, so we know what what books that the Apostle Paul and Gamaliel uh, embraced. You know, so, so that's good there. Um, as far as the New Testament, you know, because uh, my book is mostly on the Old Testament, even though chapter 10 does uh, touch on the New Testament a little bit. But for the New Testament, I cannot emphasize Canon Revisited by Dr. Michael Kruger. That is a must-have. And, and again, it's not an easy book to read, but it, you can have confidence that the self-authoritative model of the New Testament um, you know, is, is, um, it are, includes the books that are in our Bibles today. And that's the, that's the um, um, and, we can, and we can also have assurance that we didn't simply just borrow the New Testament canon from the Catholic Church. You know, we can, the, the, the New Testament can tell us itself, you know, that, that these books and only these books belong in it. Um, Eusebius' church history, there's some bits and pieces in it that are good because it preserves some of the early Old Testament canonical lists like Melito and Origen and others. Uh, and it makes it very clear that early on in the church, they embraced this smaller canon. You know, even if it wasn't identical, it was either identical or nearly identical. Yeah, I think also F.F. F. Bruce wrote a book on canon that I might recommend. Okay. Yeah, I, I yeah I did, I, and I quoted F.F. F. Bruce and Bruce Metzger. They both have books. The name of them are off my hand, but if you get my book, I quote both of them, and I quote the books that they actually use. So F.F. F. Bruce, Bruce Metzger, and again the titles uh, evade me right now, but I do cite them. You know, so you you if you get my book, you look at the 
Um, you look at the footnotes, you'll be able to get those books as well, and I think they're still in print. Yeah, uh, and for the uh, Septuagint, uh, do you recommend any specific works on there? Like, uh, what's her name? She, uh, she and Moy Silva, I think, wrote a co-authored a book. Uh, yeah, that. Go ahead. Oh no, no, go ahead. No, I, I mean, I'm not really familiar with her in particular, what she wrote on, but I mean, if if uh, um, you recommend it, yeah, you know, oh, whatever. Oh, yeah, um, it was K Karen Jobes, I think is her name, and she wrote a book with Moy Silva on the, uh, specifically the Septuagint. It's like called The Invitation to the Septuagint. Mm -hmm. Really good work. It breaks down all the different uh, Septuagints and uh, gives a, it's just like pretty much, it's awesome. Yeah, um, and like and like I mentioned before, it's like if there was a single Septuagint, then why did Amiotitis or or, or or not Amiotitis, but Oxyrhynchus, the discovery of Ox Oxyrhynchus, include books that are that were in the Septuagint and the Old Latin, like Third Esdras, that aren't in Catholic Old Testaments today? You know, why are they? You know, why why are these these books in the Septuagint? Because there was different versions of the Septuagint back then. So the idea that the Septuagint today. Um, that includes the Apocrypha was in the Septuagint in Jesus' day is, is anachronistic. So, uh, basically now I want to ask you, what are, what's your plans, to, what are you going to do next? I, I believe I heard you say that you wanted to start on the Marian uh, dogmas. <laughs> Who knows, Vincent? I mean, wherever the Lord leads me. <laughs> um, you know, I bring up Jeff Robinson a lot because he's a, he helped me a lot as far as getting my ready for my debate with uh, Trent Horn, so uh, I'm uh, in debt to him. But we actually did a um, uh, discussion on the perpetual virginity of Mary. As a matter of fact, um, the very first video that I uploaded on YouTube about nine years ago where I tackled this was about whether or not Mary was a perpetual virgin or if she was just a virgin until she gave birth to Jesus, which is supported by the Isaiah prophecy in Isaiah 7.14. Um, and we just spent like two and a half hours just discussing every single argument we could think of that the Catholic Church brings up, um, how they view certain passages from the Old and the New Testament. Um, we discussed Psalm 69, how that is, and that's actually the whole chapter is a messianic prophecy, you know, and it tells us that Jesus did have brothers because it says that it talks about being estranged from his, his mother's children you know, or mother's sons. Um, and so I would encourage people to check that out. It's on, it's on my playlist on YouTube. It's Born Again RN, and it's under the um, Marian playlist, you know, and, it's, and it links directly to his um, website where we had our discussion. So whether or not I write a book on it, I don't know if I will. You know, if God, you know, directs me to do it, of course I will. But it's going to be in God's timing and according to his will. Aren't all things. So I, I really do appreciate you coming. I gotta keep saying it because I, I have enjoyed this this uh, conversation. And I don't mind letting you go off. So this is maybe the perfect show for you, because uh, yeah, uh, to me the it, canons of for one it's a it's a large issue, and then secondly it's an important issue. Yeah, and I would say it's it's I would put the importance over the the even the large issue because it is a whole big topic and. Even for the amount of time that we've discussed this, we've barely scratched the surface. That's why I encourage people to get the book because that way they can have something either in their hand or, or on their phone or tablet that they can actually read at their leisure and at their own pace because it, it is a lot of information that's coming at you fast and furious. Um, but at the same time, I like platforms like yours where you allow me to speak because um, I can reach a much larger audience at this point, and you never know who you're going to touch. I mean, like I says, I, I, I've talked with people like Dr. Michael um, Brown, who has a much, who has a very you know large audience, and then I'll, I'll be talking with a gentleman whose YouTube channel is smaller smaller than mine. But I want to reach them as well because um, I want to share what I know, you know, and the fact that I had a Catholic upbringing. Um, in my book, I've got over 630 references. About 60% of them are from Catholic resources, not Protestant, including the Vatican to back up my case. And, um, and another 40 or so are from a Jewish, Eastern Orthodox, and other non-Protestant sources. So I wanted this book to be as objective as possible and not just draw from, like I said, your FF Bruce and Bruce Metzger's and stuff. I, I wanted to use as many Catholic sources as possible um, to be objective. Now, I have two more questions, and and because I know you have a life, and I don't want to 
keep you here forever. <laughs> Shoot. Uh, so one of them is going to be, uh, uh, well, you know, maybe the Catholics don't have the answer, but, you know, good thing there's the Coptic and Eastern Orthodox, uh, various Orthodox churches out there. We can always rely on their infallibility. So uh, what, what do you think about people who use it, the canon argument instead of for the Roman Catholic Church, for the Eastern Orthodox or the various other traditions out there? Well, I, I have to respond the same way I would to a Catholic. I says, well, "How can you back up your authority?" I says, "If you're going to back up your authority because this, because the New Testament tells you that the Church is the pillar and shield of the truth, um, and you're using this to prove the authority of the Church, and then you're using the authority of the Church to define what Scripture is and what Scripture isn't, that's circular reasoning. Another thing too is how, how do you respond to the Catholic Church that says?" that, well, the books that are in your Old Testaments that are actually larger than Catholic Old Testaments, why were, not the, why were these books not in the 4th century councils of Rome, Hippo, and Carthage? Why were they not in, included in these first tiers of what's considered the Old Testament canon of the early Church Fathers? Why do the New Testament writers and Jesus himself not quote these books um, as inspired scripture? Because um, some of these books that are in like Eastern Orthodox Bibles that's not in Catholic Bibles uh, do pop up in the New Testament and even the Oriental Orthodox, the Ethiopian Orthodox, um, they include um, First Enoch and First Enoch is quoted by Jude. But again, what all these books have in common is that the New Testament writers do not cite them specifically as scripture with one of these phrases. And they'll say, well, not all of the books that are in Protestant Old Testaments use one of these phrases either, like Lamentations and others, or Obadiah. And it's like, well, yeah, that's true, but we have to remember that a lot of these books were attached to books like Jeremiah and Hosea that were. Like the 12 minor prophets were all grouped together. So just because Obadiah is not directly quoted as scripture, because it was part of the minor prophets as one book, they would be considered you know, one book of scripture, sort of like Lamentations with Jeremiah. Jeremiah was cited as scripture in the New Testament, so so would be Lamentations. But all these other books, they're not cited as scripture anywhere at all. And, and I think, isn't it true that they also don't have like a, a completely closed canon? They're very fluid in some places of the world. Yeah, because even your Eastern Orthodox, it's like that. It's kind of a broad term because out of the twelve patriarchs and and, and denominations, so to speak, within uh, Eastern Orthodox, they don't all agree on the same books, and they have priority for some books over others. Like, for instance, your Georgian Orthodox have more books in it than your Greek Orthodox do, and and they don't really. Their understanding of a canon is different than the way Catholics and Protestants in the West, you know, understand it. If if it's if it's scripture, it's canon. If it's canon, it's scripture. And so they can say, this book is in our Bible, but it's not necessarily inspired. You know, that's foreign to us. So, you know, how do you make a determination, you know, in these Eastern churches between a book that is inspired and comes from God and is not man-made? I mean, something is either of God or it's not. I mean, it's, it's that dichotomy, you know, that um, is, doesn't exist in, in these Eastern churches. So in the, since the late 1800s, the Roman Catholic Church has allowed for kind of modern critical methods to be utilized by Catholic scholars. That's why, I mean, that's why you can have a Joseph Fitzmaier. Mm -hmm. uh, so do, do those developments affect anything uh, that we've discussed today? <laughs> I think they, they, they affect the, the validity and the, and the authority of churches that allow developments. I mean, right down to, you know, certain doctrines and dogmas in the Catholic Church developing, like the Marian dogmas that you mentioned earlier before. I tell people, it's like, well, how come these, uh, the things that we do agree with the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, like the deity of Christ, the Trinity, the virgin birth, the, the atonement and the resurrection, why do these things did need to be developed over time? You can find them directly in Scripture. You know, anything that's um, developed is something that clearly wasn't taught because if it was taught, it wouldn't have needed to develop over time, like the bodily assumption of Mary. That doesn't even pop up in the church until like 500 years later. So um, when they start saying that certain things developed, 
they're actually going they're actually rebuke refuting their own their own self authority you know well with protestants are like you know we we base things on sola scriptura our faith on sola scriptura and, beca- and by doing that we take the authority away from us and put it on the word of god right i think uh, that i don't want to get a big topic but i think uh, william albright so you mentioned that the bodily assumptions found in like the 500s and and uh well first mentioned and from my from my recollection uh albright he'll argue that there is actually first century attestation to it no well well, well, go ahead go ahead i want i I, want to hear what you have to say and in my mind i'm just like oh yeah so basically the church never knew about any of these things till till Mm -hmm. william albright and a a select group of uh catholic individuals because i've never actually seen this evidence um, I only hear about it. He usually references it in uh, some uh, passing and shows. And um, well, I, I, go ahead. I, I would just find it very suspicious that nobody at the Second Vatican Council would have heard of these things. And even still, we have various popes' own testimonies that that, that is clearly this was evidence of development. Yeah. Yeah, and what it is is that they'll take a seed or something from an early church father, and then they'll develop it more, and they'll go to another church father. So they, you know, so what you actually see is you see the development of something simple, just like you know, believing that that Peter was the the rock. Even if Peter was the rock, which I don't believe he was, uh, but even if he was the rock, that's worlds away from him being the pope and the leader of the, of the entire church and the vicar of Christ. Um, but well, I, I've heard William try to use Epiphanius of Salamis, you know, from the fourth and early fifth century, that or fourth century, that um, he believed he taught the bodily assumption of Mary. Because what he does is that he gives a list of of old and New Testament saints and what they did and what, and what happened to them, and trying to you know correlate that to Christ. You know, like for instance, he'll say about you know Christ, you know, bod, or, you know, ascending into heaven, and then he'll compare it to Mary or something, and you'll see. See that here's evidence that that Mary bodily assumed into heaven as Jesus did, and it's like, no, he's actually just talking about Mary. He's not actually saying that Mary bodily assumed into heaven. He, he's he's talking about characteristics of these these Old Testament, New Testament saints, not that they did the same thing that Jesus did. I mean, it's a real stretch, and this it's this type of false typology that you see in a lot of Catholic apologetics. Including like Swan Sana, you know, who um, is is big on on trying to defend the papacy, where he'll make correlations between um, Matthew chapter sixteen eighteen, where where Jesus gives the keys to Peter, and he'll say, and this is back from Isaiah chapter uh, twenty two twenty two, where Eleazar is given keys, and he makes all these correlations. But where do these typologies end? It, because you you can actually abuse a typology. Because you can go on to say that the papacy has military powers or military authority because Eleazar did. And at one point, Eleazar's authority, and and if he had any successors, they eventually fell out of power. So are you saying that the papacy um, is going to fall out of power? You know, so what what ends up happening to the authority of of the one true church? You know, that. And so then the New Testament does use typologies of the Old Testament, but they're typologies which are already established in Scripture. It's not something that happened later. And, you know, and for instance, like William Albrecht made, likes to draw from early church fathers um, regarding some of the Marian dogmas and correlations between Mary being a perpetual virgin, a virgin and um, the, the oath of, supposedly of celibacy of a virgin back in, in like 1st or 2nd Samuel. But if, but according to the New Catholic version of the Bible, or maybe it's the New American Bible, it specifically say this was not the view of the early church. The early church did not make this correlation between the two, even though William Albrecht claims that it does. So I, would, I appreciate that so much. Uh, thank you for your input on um, on such a range of issues uh, regarding Roman Catholicism. I, I really do appreciate that. Not, not a lot of people will will go from the canon to uh, <laughs> Vatican II to uh, the Mary, uh, you know. Uh, perpetual virginity and so forth so uh, I, I appreciate your versatility yeah well a lot of these subjects really overlap and, and again it, it gets back to the issue of authority the authority of the church over the authority of scripture and you cannot prove the authority of the church 
because you have to establish what is Scripture first. And this is the reason why the Council of Rome even stated that the Scriptures gave us the Church. The Church did not give us the Scriptures. That is a later Catholic belief that is um, retroactively and anachronistically put back into the, into the first century. So I, I want to say I, I definitely love this interview. I want to have you on again for other issues. I especially, I would love to have a video with you on justification by faith alone have a little talk about that um, oh yeah definitely i mean because that was luther's breakthrough i mean luther we have to remember he was very educated he had uh two bachelors two masters and a doctorate degree he was he was dr martin dr luther and even though he had read romans numerous times and even taught on it his breakthrough moment was when he read that we are that um you know we're we are justified in, you know by by from faith to faith and and when he quotes when Paul quotes Habakkuk, he says, the, the, um, the righteous shall live by faith, he understood Greek. And he understood that the Greek word for live means to live eternally. It came from the same you know, Greek word that, that says, you know, for God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, whoever believes in him shall not um, die but, but, but live or whatever. He, he understood it. it came from this same, the same Greek word to mean to live eternally. So he understood Paul was saying, that the righteous will live eternally by faith, and this is where faith alone came from, and it was like a light bulb, you know, that that went off in his head, and that's when he realized that the the the, the doctrine of faith alone, the concept, comes from the scriptures themselves. I also want to add for anyone listening, I'm going to make an article, and I'm going to take all of uh, the debates and links to his books, uh, and by him I mean Steve right here. Uh, I'm going to put all this stuff into a resource article so you guys have a, a source to, you know, if you like this interview, you like his stuff, please go ahead, click on it, go see more. It's, it's too much to talk about one interview. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, I want to, I want to make the va stuff available to as many people as possible. So I appreciate you, you know, uh, creating the links. I mean, like my own link to my, um, my um, website is from my first book. It's not in my second book. Um, but it's a way of me kind of giving back because on my website I've got about 70 Bible studies that have been uploaded on a range of different topics, not just the canon, you know, where I use, you know, scripture references and other references as well to back up what scripture actually says because mm -hmm. scripture is a primary resource because it's infallible. Um, but I even my first book, I've got a study guide, you know, that's on there that's for free. The, the notes, the study notes are downloadable for free. Um, you know, so it's it's a way of giving back and saying thank you to people who are interested in knowing the truth about what Scripture says and what Scripture contains. Um, you know, and, and I I just want to reach as many people as possible and and give a little bit back. And thank you. We appreciate. I've benefited from your stuff. I I, I believe anyone who who is a, uh, dealing with these issues care about to care about the issue of the canon will definitely appreciate everything you've done and that's why i'm so glad to have you on that's why when you uh, said oh yeah I'll come on i was i was shocked i was definitely uh, oh. so uh, i'm gonna say you know thank you for everyone for tuning in i'm gonna end the stream uh steve any last words nope i i just want to say thank you again for having me on i'm very humble the pleasure has been all mine and um god bless all of your listeners and uh, if you have any questions you get my material feel free to reach out to me i can be contacted on facebook youtube and twitter my handle is born again rn rn because i'm a registered nurse um and and and, and then you'll put the links as far as my website it's vernissage.us backslash steve christie it's a mouthful so that's why the the link will be most helpful thank you